uh, hey, Divine, you know I always troll you in a sense uh, when I say that you don't believe the Bible. Yep. And, and, and to a certain extent, I do believe that. But um, not to be <laughs> no, but that's what that's what we wanted. That's well, that's what we want to talk about. So bring it out, my brother. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but I'm saying here's why. Every time we're having a biblical conversation, you get the floor. You start to go into all of this extracurricular writing that nobody really cares for. Here's why, because that stuff is not scripture. It's just another man's opinion on the same book that we all supposed to believe in. And then you use these other people's writings, which are just people's opinion, just like mine's and yours on the scripture, to kind of change the context of what we're reading by telling us that this wasn't there or that wasn't there. Like, I have a hard time having conversations with you or even listening to you because you always do that. And I'm not tripping because you choose to go that route. I'm just saying what you're reading uh, from history is not inspired by God. It's not God's word. I would rather trust that the Bible is inspired and that we can take that and uh, we could depend on that. And that could be the anchor because I believe that the God that we serve can protect his word. Like the message that he's been trying to convey to each generation, he can literally preserve it and protect it like he do the animals and even the human, the human race that's so precious in his eyes. What's so hard about that, Divine? Like, why can't you just believe that our God can preserve his word like he do the trees, the birds, and even our lives from generation to generation? All right. So a couple of things I want to correct. First and foremost, you said the people's opinions. And I don't know what references that I said that you're referring to when you say that. All of uh, because I mentioned, hold on, I mentioned the Septuagint. Dre brought up the Targum. Right, you, you you believe that those are people's opinions as well. No, right? I'm talking about the like, I'm talking about things like the brother. That's what we were talking about. Brooklyn. Let me uh, explain. I'm talking about like the, the book you 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 uh the, the old guy that you said that's getting ready to die or is already dead. Emmanuel like that, twelve. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that guy you say, Dre. I recommend you read it. Why do Dre need to read his book as if his word is the final authority on the word? It, it, it word is when it comes to the Hebrew Bible because there's a thing called textual what? criticism. Let me let me yeah, let me explain to you what I mean by that, brother. Because maybe maybe you just unaware of the discipline. And that's why when I talk to you, I try to remove those things because you try to disarm me of any information outside what we read on the a cursory reading of the text. And that's fine. I can entertain that, right? That's why I said in my position in regards to the virgin birth, there are different facets of it. And that's why every time I mention it, I like to give a source, right? So people can go see and fact check what I'm saying. You don't got to take my word for it, right? But let me answer, let me answer your question. So Jay, do we have the autographs of the Old and New Testament? And if you don't know what an autograph is, it's the original writing from the actual authors themselves. Do, we, do they exist? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, so they don't exist. Why didn't God preserve that? Listen, I, listen, I said, I'm not sure. You have to talk to somebody that's a little bit more astute. In I don't have to talk to anybody. I know. I'm just seeing if you know. If not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it to you. They don't exist. There's no autographs of the Old or New Testament that exist today. None. So if okay. they don't exist, wait, listen, if they don't exist, and we have thousands of manuscripts for both the Old and New Testament, which one is right and which one is wrong? Because they have variants amongst them. Well, so, so divine, and this is where I would have to use scripture, the just shall live by faith. I simply believe that the words that's written in the book is what God wants me to read and the message that he's trying to convey to me. Which, when like, you say book, which, which, which translation, brother? Because, you know, I'm talking, different translations represent different manuscripts that they do the translations from. So which translation are you referring to? For, for instance, I use the NASB, like I hold to that version. Ah, gotcha. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. I look when I read the King James, um, th there's some text that sometimes I can be like, huh? But it's still in a. In, for, in wait, wait, a wait, scale, wait, wait, wait! Why do you have that well, position well, if you said that God preserved His word? Um, there, there's certain. All right, for instance, uh, when we have the the Jesus is God conversation, um, Revelation I believe is uh I think it's um chapter 3 verse 14 i believe it said he's the firstborn of god creation um when i look at uh when i look at the greek text it doesn't really say that it says uh the originator which would coincide or walk wait, in wait 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 why are you going wait why are you going to the greek text brother i'm confused um because when when 
that particular verse, it gives the notion that uh, Jesus is created. But I can I can walk with the King James even on that. But when I'm having a technical conversation with like a Hebrew Israelite, I would have to kind of go that route and then ref, uh, stand back on the NASB to show them that it's not saying that he's created. It's just saying that he's the originator. But the way King James wrote it, we would have we would have to have the conversation uh, as if he's actually a part of creation. But that's not what the Bible overall is trying to convey. OK, so I got you. So 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 wait. So why did you why do you choose the NASB? Why did you choose that translation? Have you read the preface or the translator's notes to kind of understand where, where it's derived from? Because I could read um, it for you if you need it. Mm -hmm. No, nah, no. Nah, look, that's what I'm saying. All of that is not really necessary. If I'm having a conversation, <laughs> let's say. On okay, God, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> you got it. No, no, no. Here's what here's what I'm saying that because when I'm having a conversation uh, on the Godhead, I have the old and the new, and I can look at all that surrounding His name concerning that the word God, right? We can go in the Old Testament. We can see that He's Yahweh. He's the one that's going to be pierced on the cross. We can literally see that translate. We can literally read that in the New Testament. We have John one. We have Hebrews one. And so these problems or these so-called problems that would be created from the Hebrew Israelite perspective, that would be uh, their understanding of who Jesus is, it's easy to fix. I don't have to do any extra reading. Outside so, brother, let me, let me, yeah, let me read this from you. This is from the preface of the New American Standard Version. This edition of the NASB represents updates according to modern English usage and refinements recommended over the last several years as well as updates based on current research of the ancient manuscripts brother are you aware that the translation that you're reading this is what's in the preface of it that's why i asked you brother if you read the preface because most of the time when people read books i assume they read the preface most people don't how do you know the intention of the author that's what's in the preface so so why are they saying that it's based over the last several years as well as updates based on current research of the ancient manuscripts brother you got a flawed book brother because they're looking at ancient manuscripts there's updates in the research in regards to those manuscripts and therefore there are changes that are made did you know that yeah. the nasb has several wait wait brother hold on several revisions are you reading the 1995 version are you reading the 1975 version are you reading the 2020 version? which one are you reading brother most sometimes i click on when i'm on bible hub i use any one because they're all saying no they don't <laughs> brother do you know the difference all... between the 1995 nasb and the 2020 i could give you about 68 differences brother brother that's based on no, no. Okay, okay go ahead brother go ahead. hold on divine slow down a little bit i'm saying when we're reading text for text verse for verse they're all saying the same exact thing 1995 1997 in the current one all right and even the asv they're awesome and then look not only that when i click on other uh translations the translations the other translations are saying the same thing they just may use different verbiages but they're, they're pretty much conveying the same message well so it's not a problem well, so okay so let's do this right uh forget the king james version right um for now and i'm saying that because you know that's not my go-to translation right um so forget that my go-to translation is the esv because I believe that the latest version of the ESV, it, it's as faithful to the NA28, right? The Nestle Allen 28, which is the New Testament text that is the academic standard, and the BHS, the Biblia Hebraica Stuta Argentia, that represents the standard academic text of the Old Testament, right? So the ones that I use is called the Greek English Interlinear ESV New Testament and the uh, Hebrew English interlinear ESV of the Old Testament. Those are the two Bibles that I recommend anybody to look at because what it does, uh, Jay, is that it gives you the original language and then right underneath that, it gives you the direct translation of the original language and it does not regard English syntax, right? Because you're gonna read it in English the way it actually reads in the original language, right? But these are derived off of those two academic text that almost all modern critical edition Bibles, which includes the NASB, are derived from. And you're going to see that if you get a Bible derived from the Texas Receptus, which is represented by the KJV or the NKJV, which is an update of the KJV, you'll see that there are readings in it that differ from what you read in the NA28, Greek text. It's not the same, but there's, there's, there's a ton of differences. And as we discover more and more manuscripts, 
we take in consideration any variation between them. Some of them are just like simple scribal errors. Some of them are just the way an actual sentence in the Greek is formed. Sometimes we have the verb first before the subject, we have the subject before the verb, an adverb here, adjective here. However, in Greek, because of the clenches and inflections, we know what connects with what, right? By just looking at Greek syntax, it's more flexible than it is in English, right? Because in English, it probably won't make no sense, but in Greek, there's various ways that you can say something and it still mean the same thing. English is a little bit more different, it's a little more rigid, right? But I say that to say to you, brother, is I'm not out here trying to decimate the text. I'm trying to give a better understanding based on the existential evidence that exists. I just had to read for you the preface of the NASB. Did you know that there's differences between the ESV and NASB? And it's different between the NASB and the New King James Version of the Bible? And it's not because, oh, we're just going to translate it this way because we think this sounds right. That's not what translational theory or how it works, brother. They take their time to decide what kind of translation they want to convey. So let me ask you a question. The NIV, do you like the NIV? Hold, hold on, Devon. I, I think that you're missing what I'm saying. That's why okay. your line in the questioning doesn't really apply to me. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any smoke with the translations or what you're bringing about the translations. I have smoke when you tell a brother, oh, go and read this guy. <laughs> So, that, so, so wait, I can't tell no, nobody no, to no, read no, outside the Bible, listen, brother. Come no, on, brother. Listen, I, I hear you do this all the time. And this is why I say you don't believe in the Bible. You believe in commentary. I say this to you all the time, right? Because you're always yes, referring somebody to comment to somebody's commentary to help them understand the Bible. I think brother, that is brother, error. what brother, so, listen, hold on, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Get it out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up in like five seconds. I think that's error. I think that uh the creator left his word here i think he can protect his word and so i think his word uh the strength of his word is here even though we have different translations where it may sound a little different but the overall message that's being conveyed is the same from uh translation to translation so i don't think a brother like dre or me or hell even you divine need to go need to go read somebody else's opinion on what the text is saying to understand the bible in fact, I think that's the easiest way for the devil to get a hold of your mind. And that's why when I listen to you, Divine, I say, I don't think you believe the Bible. I think you listen to people who may uh, convey a message about the text that's comfortable for you. And that's OK. So you go ahead and read that stuff and you hold that stuff. So when you get on stage, you don't talk Bible, you talk commentary. And that's just my perspective. I'm not tripping, though, on the translations of Divine. I just want to be clear on that. I'm, I'm really so, not. So, so let me ask you a question, right? Have you ever heard of something called translator's notes? Here we go. When it comes to Bible trans, <laughs> no, look, I'm gonna tell you why, brother. No, look, watch, watch this because I'm gonna show you something, right? And again, right, right, we can right. we can move away from this and just deal with the text, brother. I'm gonna meet you where you're at, right? I don't have to talk to you with all the extra stuff. We can just deal with the text. I'm okay with that. So just so you know, we can just deal with the text. I'm okay with that. But I just want to enlighten you on something so that you're aware. This is not about undermining faith. It's about substantiating your faith and ensuring that you actually have an anchor that's keeping you grounded, that you're not that you're on firm ground and not on sand, that you're building your house on. Translators' notes is where the translators themselves tell you why they translate something a certain way or explain to you a footnote that exists in part of the translation. Now, why is that even there? You are relying on the interpretative lens of the translator. That's what you're doing. You have faith in the translator. Does that mean the translator is inerrant? Well, if so, there wouldn't be no revisions. There wouldn't be no updates. That, that does that not make sense, brother? Nah. He, he, nah. That, okay. That make, gotcha. No, no. Listen, look, no, not divine. It makes sense, right? But here's what I'm saying: bigger than the translator, and maybe I'm just a fool for thinking this way, right? But I, I just believe that the creator, right? I'm looking at his planet that uh history says been here before i was born and i can only believe that because guess what it was here before i got here and the the, the same god that we believe in preserved it I, i'm not okay you know like you, you see what's going on with uh these politicians and the, they want the climate crisis and all this crap i think that's insane to even be ha holding that in your mind because at the end of the day this planet been here before you got here what are you worried about uh climate change for I believe that's something that's out of our control. The creator has that in his hand. He's holding that down, right? Why would I be worried about the planet? Well, he's allowing man to have have temporary dominion and man is not being 
the proper caretaker of the dominion that the Most High put in under his control. So we should be aware because that can directly affect you and your family and your livelihood while you exist here on this planet and your children so, are here on this planet. So, so, so Divine, do you think that uh, this new generation of people that came thousands and maybe millions of years after the first two human beings that was on here is going to destroy God's planet, planet without, without his say? According to Jesus, he said not with even one sparrow, not even one of them small little birds that we see running around and flying around in the summertime fall without his or uh, I think his without his okay or his consent. I have to go back and read it in Matthew. But I think he Jesus made that clear that not one of these little sparrows die without uh without his okay. So why would I worry about the planet being destroyed? And that's and this is what I'm saying. Like I just have to I just have to take this stuff by faith because God is trying to give his word to every generation until his coming, right? I just have to live with the understanding in my mind that, you know what, this word is as authentic as it's going to get. And this is what God is trying to get to me. So I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to worry too much about somebody adding or taking anything from the word of God, because I just simply believe that he can preserve his word. Now, if you yeah, choose and, and to I would say, go about it a different no, way, no. that's cool. No, no, no. What I'm going to say to you is the remarkable thing about scripture is that over 90% of it has been preserved. You can't say that about any other text that has no, there's actually no other text that has as many copies as it does. Um, but nonetheless, you can't say that about texts that even have hundred. It, the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, right? His Iliad uh, has a couple hundred manuscripts and there's more variants amongst them than there is in the New Testament manuscripts. That's remarkable. So that is the fingerprint that the Most High has his hands on his word. So again, brother, I'm not, I'm not undermining that. What I'm simply trying to explain to people is that whenever we have a conversation, there's points that we agree, right? When we get to a point that we disagree, right? Everybody's going to say, well, I'm reading what the text says. I'm explaining to you what the text says. Everybody's going to say that. So how do you confirm are you going to say, oh, my Holy Spirit that I have in me is better than the Holy Spirit you have in you, brother? Or by you making ad hominem saying, well, you don't really believe the Bible? Brother, that doesn't affect me because I do subscribe to the Bible, right? The difference is the degree in which I study it because I subscribe to it so much. It, it behooves me to share what I come across with everybody else because you can, the, okay, the root of all ignorance, right? It's very important, is the dismissal of knowledge. That's the root of ignorance. When the scripture says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, not because the knowledge doesn't exist, it's because they reject. Yo, did you go on the make? Did he go on the matrix or I went out? Nah, he cut out. You there, Devon? Nah, he has a poly. He gonna probably bump, probably back in. Say that again. The main thing, bro, is y'all talking past each other, bro. Devon is making a point about the differences in the translations. There's even some verses that are not in the NIV that's in other translations, uh, the NSB and so on and so forth. They have they have different they have different uh, words and, and scriptures that are translated differently, right? But your point that you're making is that you're not going to go to commentaries. Like, for example, um, one thing that Devon stated was about um, three different, you know, theories that have been since the, you know, that time period um, and how one is the minor voice, right, and the other two might be louder voices as far as how many people uh, echo those and feel that way. However, it doesn't uh, dis um, invalidate um, the one that's the minor voice, right? But it's one that's in scripture, right? But the other ones have commentaries based on the standard third. So many words you're just saying, I'm not going to adhere and, and go outside of what the scriptures say and try to put, you know, and, and use that cultural context, the historical context, whatever it may be, right? I'm just going to use the scriptures and have faith in what the Bible says, right? Which is fine. And Divine is saying, look, I'm going to go a step further than that. And yeah, it may not be canonical, Right. But I'm going to go and research this and hear what these other uh, the, what the other one said, how they took the text, how they may have translated it. 
or took what the words meant and, and got to this conclusion, right? And and I'm going to go, and, and he may go with that. It might not be the original, the one that's canonical. It may be a variant, right, or a different theory, whatever, right? But y'all are saying two different things in so many words, right? So many yeah, so let me, let me just say something real quick, Jody, if you can still hear me. Uh, what I was simply saying is when we come to a point of contention, how do we go about resolving that? So and give, I think give that an that example though, Divine. Don't just say don't okay, just, okay, okay, okay. Wait, wait. I, give us. A I'm gonna I'm give you one, right? And yeah. the, the topic at top, the virgin birth. There are two positions on that. There's one group that says that there is no virgin birth, and there's another group that says there is a virgin birth, right? So if you talk to both groups, both groups are reading from the same text. They come to different conclusions. So what do you do to mediate that? Um, you have to be I'll, able to go a step further, right? You have to be able to actually maybe sometimes look at the words in the original language. Uh, maybe sometimes look to see uh, what the original language is saying based on the syntax, right, or grammar. Maybe sometimes that may not be enough. Maybe sometimes you may need to get a consensus to say, okay, how is this read amongst the church fathers in different eras? How did they see it, right? Especially the ones that was in the anti-Nicene era that was the closest of the first couple of hundred years after Jesus died. How did they see that, right? How did they posit that? What was the explanation? For example, Jody is right there. Me and Jody had a conversation uh, in regards to one of the notes in Second Timothy, right? Uh, that was in the uh, the Net Bible, right? Um, and there was an issue in regards to how to translate Savior and God, right? Because from a cursory reading, that's what it says. And the Net uh, commentary, it says that it's based on who? Let me see who's the person that you're supposed to go research, brother. Let me see if you do his homework. You said who was I supposed to go research? I, I remember yeah. this Net Bible, Net Bible or uh, uh -huh. what, what were we discussing? It was two different points there. What no, no, we were discussing the note that was talking about Second Timothy in regards to Savior and God. Yes. Or Savior and Lord, you see that? And who, yeah. who, whose rule? Whose rule did we uncover looking at that commentary? Hold on one second. Sure, take yeah, your time. I'm the visual. One second. I know we went to. And, and you're going to see why I'm saying this, Jay. It's because when you come to a point of contention, sometimes you have to introduce information that is not inherent in the translation. And sometimes that may require you to go and look at the original language. It may also have you have to go and require and look at other manuscripts. I'll give you an example. Do you believe that Mark chapter 9, not uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to the last verse is inspired? Is that is that your um, position? I, I'd have to go look at exactly what you're talking about. Can right, we I read it for you. The, wait, 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 can we yeah. just confine the conversation to this virgin birth real quick? Uh, if you'd like, sure. I, I'm, what I'm what I'm gonna demonstrate while mm -hmm. you're uh, when you're done is exactly mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Okay. See, you're you're going outside of the text for the tiebreaker. I don't think that's necessary. I think there's enough information in the text from Matthew from Matthew one to Luke three to break the tie. Like it's not that hard. I don't think we need to go and look at anybody else's opinion on it. We could just look at what's in front of us and say, well, what's okay. what's what's my what's my position on the Greek text as it pertains to Matthew chapter one? What did I say earlier? Let me see if you was paying that, that, attention. Um, it's, exactly, because you're arguing a mute point. What I said was, wait, wait, hold on, wait, 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 hold on. We said a lot of things. I may not be as sharp in the memory as a brother like Corey, but you can drag my memory. Now you Gucci, I'm so I'm about, I'm about to tell you, my brother. So what I'm saying is, yeah. I said from the Greek text, it affirms mm -hmm. the virgin birth. So, so what are you arguing with me for? I don't understand. So, what are we debating? No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying that we said a lot before uh, just now you didn't really say you didn't say that um i did say that who was here wait, earlier rodney was here dre was here dre you wait, still there I, w I may have not hold on wait, wait a second divine i'm saying just now when when i just said okay don't just blanket it give me an example you brought up the virgin birth, but after you brought that up you didn't just say what you just right did i say that yes so, or no remember, dre? I, I i came in I think he did mention. I think he said. I think he mentioned based on the text, it it is conveying 
that idea. I think he just mentioned uh, other manuscripts exactly. didn't have some of that information in it that uh, that we see in this one. So, brother, there's some Drake, there's some well, new point to argue Goodbye, with me what? whether the Greek text that's represented in the translation that you're reading is supporting yeah, yeah, the virgin on, birth or not. Second, we don't want to. We don't want to remember. I just came in a room about the time you see me in the comment section. That's when I. Oh, uh, okay, in the room. no problem. Right. So if you said that before, I didn't hear that because I wasn't in a room. So now that you know it, where I, where are we going with the conversation? No, we don't have to go nowhere because now I, I have your position. No, so my no, you don't have my full position. But I just want to make sure that you were no listen. Yeah, but I just want to make sure that you weren't misunderstanding. No, 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 brother. Listen to me, brother. I, I completely understand it, right? That's why this is my position. I'm gonna tell you what my position is, right? You have the tradition that appears in the Greek text. The best representative today of the Greek text is what's called the, the nomenclature is NA28. That is the text that most translations derive their original Greek from. Okay. And if you want a copy of that, I could post it up top and you could take a look at it for yourself, right? After I finish um, what I'm about to say. And when we read it in the Greek text, right? From, from my perspective, right? It conveys the message of a virgin birth. I don't, I don't disagree with that. I never said I disagree with that. I'm not arguing to you from the Greek text. What I'm saying to you is there's other manuscript evidence that represents something in certain places that are different from the Greek text that we have, verses 16 and verses 25. This is also considered the Bible. This is not a man's commentary that I'm going to. And I said that that best represents holistically what is being conveyed within the context of what's being said. For example, the genealogy that we see goes from father to son. The word egenethin in the Greek is used there, which indicates father to son, father to son, father to son, father to son. And then in verse 16 in the Greek text, it changes. And it gives the agency of begetting to Miriam, Marias, or Mary. That's what we see. And I said that that looks like, and, and I think it was even admitted to be a break from what was being conveyed in regards to genealogy, because nowhere in the genealogy prior to that is a woman even mentioned at all. And that would have been the case to Matthew's immediate audience. They're not going to be looking for a woman to son, and et cetera. They, they're not going to uh, put that into the equation because that's not how they, they see genealogy when you're talking about a man, right? So what I simply said was, that there is another manuscript of the New Testament called the OSS that has a difference in verse 16 where it sums up the beginning or the agent for bringing Jesus forth to Joseph, not Mary. And then in verse 25, where it says, but they did not know each other until, that's not there in the Syriac text either in the OSS. And I'm saying from my position and the pedigree that I trace my my lineal theological position to right that that is within the confines of that area of belief and that would be those what the, what academia calls jewish christians <clears throat> the jews who subscribe excuse me the jews who subscribe to the messiah the ones we see in acts chapter 21 with james right in jerusalem those individuals subscribe to the law they were zealous of the law they didn't just subscribe they were zealous of the law and they subscribed to Jesus. And Paul verified it. And then they had a problem with Paul saying, whoa, you telling Jews amongst the Gentiles not to keep the law, not to be circumcised? And then James said, yo, they're going to hear that you was here, homie. What are, we, what are we supposed to do about that? And then James, Paul didn't say nothing. James said, no, I'm a, I'm, we're going to tell you what to do, Paul. This is what you do. Go and see those guys over there. Yeah, go ahead and pay for uh, their, their ritual at the temple and you go do it with them so that everyone knows that you live in accordance with the law. That's extremely important because those believers were the ones who were responsible for the ideas that we see in this manuscript called the OSS because they subscribe to the notion that Jesus came about by the means of Joseph and Mary. Now, I also added on top of that, that those groups called the Nazarenes, the Ebionites, who subscribed to this, and it was different sects amongst those sects, right? They were tolerated by the Gentile believers in the first, second century. By the turn of the third century, we start getting them getting called heretics by several church fathers, calling them heretics. Some even saying that they 
um, that they mutilated the genealogy of Matthew chapter one. You see all these things being said. And Jerome, who comes hundreds of years after the death of Jesus, says that Matthew wrote his first gospel in the Aramaic uh, uh, text. That's what he said. Then he said that the providence of the Greek translation we know not of. This is what Jerome says. This is this is what he says. Now you'll say, oh no, that's that's his opinion. Okay, I got you. But you still cannot ignore the textual variant in verses 16 and verses 25 that I had previously posted up top. I can post it again. And you'll understand why I hold to my position. I identify as one who subscribes to the law and also accepts Jesus as a Messiah. You see that third group, that third group that's in the middle between the Jews and the Christians, there's a book called Nazarene Christianity. I recommend you go read. Oh, you know what? You don't like the source. Man, so, yeah, um, don't, don't so, so forget that. that. Uh, that third. <laughs> Stick a fit right there real quick. I, I got you, brother. Go Stick ahead. Don't, don't move, right? See, I, I don't, again, I don't need to go outside the Bible to textual criticism to make the tiebreaker between keeping the law and uh, subscribing to what's going on in the New Testament. There is just too much evidence in the text that if you're doing that, you're in violation of where God would want you to be as far as his will is concerned. We have Jesus, his own words. We have Paul's and his letters. We can dive into all that stuff. For instance, uh, we could go into Galatians chapter five, right? By the time you get down to the sixth verse, you realize that there is something wrong with messing around with this law under the new covenant, right? We ain't, it ain't we ain't gotta read, we ain't gotta read too so, much. So can we can we read in Acts 21 where Paul demonstrates that he lives in observance of the law? Is he a oh, hypocrite? No, no. Wait, no. Because okay, go ahead, brother. Again, we can dive into his letters. Uh first Corinthians 9, starting at verse what 19. He explains that when he's amongst the Jews, he live like he the Jews. He said, I've become what? as but he is as a Jew. A, he a is Jew. a Jew, right? Did that change? Yeah, yeah. So how so no, 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 it doesn't, it didn't change, but he's explaining how he live his life being a person that's going about trying to win souls for Jesus. Cause even he said, when I go amongst the people who didn't have God's law, I became as one with Paul, Paul, a Jew, right? Wait, listen, no, it's just yes on. or no divine here. The divine. Yes. He's a Jew, but hear what I'm saying. Divine in first Corinthians nine, starting at verse 19, Paul is explaining how he go about winning souls. So the first thing he says, when I'm amongst the Jews, I become as a Jew. So he explains that he's living like his brethren after the flesh when he's amongst them. But when he's amongst people who are not Jews, he start to live like the people who are not Jews. But he makes it clear that he's not without law, but he's under the law of Christ. Okay, so, so wait, 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 wait. So, so wait, brother, hold on. I, I got you. Five seconds and let me land. Five seconds. Go ahead, brother. So what I take that to be is, let's just use sports for an example. Paul saying, okay, when I'm trying to win a basketball player, no problem. I'll get on the basketball court, throw on a jersey and go play some basketball. As long as when I'm done playing basketball or during the game, I can speak Jesus Christ to them. Right? I can preach the gospel to them. When it comes to the soccer players, he go over there and he plays soccer with the soccer players, right? He do something that he have that he can find. Oh, oh, he, oh let me sorry about that. He finds something that he he has in common with these individual and start doing it so that he can preach the gospel to them. So when I see him in the book of Acts twenty one, taking that oath, no problem. He's just trying to keep the peace according to him. <laughs> and it's right, real quick, real quick. You're not reading the context, but go ahead. You said five seconds, but go ahead, brother. No, no, no. Wait. I mean, why did you laugh? No, I, 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 I mean, I just th never mind that. I apologize. Go ahead, brother. All right. So, so again, w what I'm seeing in the scriptures is it's easy to reconcile because out of Paul's own mouth, he makes it clear that that's what he does. When he go around them, he lives just like them. There's no problem with him doing the things in the law while he's around them, simply because what he's trying to preach the gospel to them. So, if you if you were uncircumcised and you was with my congregation, you would go get circumcised. No, okay, why gotcha. So that? you're not you're not even doing what Paul's doing. So let's go to no, no, hold no, on, brother. Divine, hold on. Wait a second. Divine, wait a second. First of all, I am circumcised. I said second if, of all, if I'm, that's why say, I said if. No, no, no. Yeah, but here, here's what I'm saying though. If I'm a Jew, I mean, if I'm a Gentile, let's just let's just play like we're in the Bible. I'm not required to do that because I, I first of all, that wasn't my custom. It wasn't my tradition. 
I did not have the covenant of circumcision. Paul and Paul makes that absolutely clear in Galatians chapter five to the Galatians, that if you now become circumcised, you're now in debt to keep the whole law. Because you're that right. wasn't just, just that like wasn't just like he put a brother in debt in uh, Acts chapter um, sixteen, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so here's the thing, right? When you go to First Corinthians chapter seven, right? First uh, Corinthians chapter seven, which precedes chapter nine. And we go down to verse Divine, 17. You, you, real quick, you, you want to just leave that on the table like that? Of course, we're going to come back to it. Yeah, we're going to come back okay, to it. All right. So, fix oh, yeah, no cool. yeah. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This what is my rule in all right the now? churches. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. Mm -hmm. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. What does that mean? Um, hell, I don't know how you you're gonna do that, but no, I'm asking you what it means. Forget me. Yeah, I'm asking I, I'm, you what I'm does saying, that mean. I'm saying I'm telling mm -hmm. you. I don't know how you can, uh, unless that's metaphorically speaking. But I, I don't know how you can. Wow. All right, so let me read. So when 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 Paul is giving instructions to the church at Corinth, is it Divine, metaphorical? Quick, you you kind of you kind of just repeated what I said as if that. That was a definite statement. I mean, definite position, as if that was some kind of uh, me trying to interpret the scripture. That was me just letting you know that I hadn't studied it, so I couldn't really give you an answer, a definite answer, and a position on that. That's why I said I so I'm, that I, might might be so, no, 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 no. Listen, so listen, brother. I'm gonna I'm gonna read you the okay. Yeah. So instead of just having you interpret that, because like you said, you may not remember that past. That's fine. I'm gonna be fair, right? No, I didn't say I may not remember it. I said okay, I hadn't so studied you... it. That's not a verse I've pulled and used ever. You just okay. pulled that. So let me let me let me read this for you, right? And maybe you can get the gist, the context. Because if you start reading any passage of the Bible and you read at least six passages, I'm gonna say, "Oh, I know what you're talking about." Or you know what I do? Something that you don't do. I can go to a source, <laughs> but you don't but do hold that. Up, but divine, so wait, wait, wait divine, hold on. Let me finish. Down. Let me hold on. Let me but finish. Let me finish. Look, here, here's what I don't want you to do, brother, right, brother? Let me I finish, brother. You spoke. I'm gonna let your you piece. finish. But hold on, wait, wait one second. I don't want you to straw me me by reading a half a verse and then asking me a question, especially on a scripture that I don't use, right? Just if you're gonna teach a point, then teach do you a teach, point or do read. You, do you, listen, listen, okay, I got you. Do you teach on marriage in the church to anybody? Have you taught that? Have you shared that to anybody? Divine, can we just walk step by step? No, Brother, this is, this, okay, okay, got you. So that's probably why you're not familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter seven, because if you was a pastor, part of ecclesiastical staff or something like that, and you are counseling, which I've done, Right, you go to the scripture because people will ask you, "Well, I'm married. This person who's with me is an unbeliever. Should we stay together or not?" Okay. That goes now, to now First Corinthians. Mean, now, Hold on, that goes to First Corinthians chapter seven and verse twelve. So what I'm saying is, if you're unfamiliar with First Corinthians chapter seven because you've never discussed marriage, divorce, and separation, I understand why you're probably not familiar with this, and that's fine. But I'm just trying to read for you its context. So if you go to a critical edition Bible, like your NASB that you read, right? It puts things in paragraphs. And not only that, it gives a preface. Like, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 17, in a critical edition Bible, it says, live as you are called, which means it is a what we call a divergence from the initial part of the chapter, which talks about marriage. It's diverging from that. And now he's transitioning into where it says in verse 17, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned him. It says, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not remove, seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anybody at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. But neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself to the opportunity. For he was called, who was called in the Lord as a bond servant, as a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he. Hold on, there's a lot of noise in your background. I don't know who that, that is. That ain't me. That ain't me. That's Jody. Okay, that was Jody. Wow. Smile, they washing dishes. <laughs> <I'm doing laughs> That's Jody. Oh uh, yeah, his wife like you better get it in. Watch that man. You doing all that talking on Clubhouse? Time to do some work. All right, all right. What, what all right. verse? All right, so. Okay, I'm gonna read it with you again, right? This is verse 17 in First right. Corinthians chapter seven. So, but wait, before you go, verse sure. um, verse real quick. 
because uh, I think this is this is your overall point anyway. So them commandments right there, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of God's commandments. That's correct. Com keeping of the commandments of God. Correct. Uh, so, I mean, which commandments are those, though? It depends on who we're talking about, the circumcised or uncircumcised. So if you're talking about those who are so, circumcised, so, hold on, hold so, on. Let me let me answer your question. Real quick, I just got a quick so, question. Brother, don't, you don't asked me a question. Fast. I didn't even get to finish okay, right, answering it. Uh, I was going to say to the circumcised, if you're already circumcised, and he says, do not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. The commandments of God that the circumcised received is Torah. Paul says it himself in Romans chapter 3. The very oracles of God that the Jews received. So those would be the commandments of God that they received and anything in addition to that, which would be the words from Christ, right? Because Christ did give some instructions for them to do. So everything's about obedience to the commandments because there are Jews who disobeyed and they're circumcised. They did not keep the commandments of God. And guess what? They died. So when it comes to the circumcision, they're not going to go to get circumcised. Why would they go and get circumcised? You keep the commandments of God as you were called. So Paul says in Romans chapter two about the Gentiles who keep the things of the law. So, oh, oh, damn. Are you? No, 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 no. Go ahead. That, that, that was my truck. My fault. Yeah. Romans chapter two, verse 25 says, for circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is circumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from men, but from God. And Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, right? Moses tells the people to circumcise the foreskin of your heart. And Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 19, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse, verse 26, the Jews are told that their heart would be circumcised. They would be sprinkled with water. There's a process that has to go on with them because unfortunately they do it just by being circumcised that that was enough for them to do the bare minimum of the law and be accepted by God. That's not the case. So Paul is saying that if you are circumcised, do not remove the marks of circumcision. If you're uncircumcised, do not seek to be circumcised. The only thing that matters is that you keep the commandments of God. He says, continue to walk in the calling that you were called. This is what he's saying. He is not telling Jews to break the law. And he's not telling Gentiles to go and take up the law. This is not what he's saying. He's being clear hey, I, to both parties. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that statement. But what I'm the, here's here's the contention that we'd have though, this keeping the commandments thing. Um, we'd have to reconcile the keeping the commandments. So are you are you uh saying that those that the, the word commandments there that's in reference to Moses is uh Moses's law? That's what you're saying. For those who are circumcised, it can incorporate that as well, because that does not work in contradiction to subscribing to Christ, as we see in Acts chapter 21. Yeah, yes, it absolutely. So that means will, James will, James is a heretic well. then. Do you agree that James is a heretic? Nah, okay, um, gotcha. absolutely not, because here's why. When James is speaking on the law, that was a description of how the law works. That was not- In Acts chapter 21? Can you go to Acts chapter 21 right, and read right. that real quick? Hold on. See, we, we move in too fast. Yes, because you're thinking I'm like, talking about the epistle of James, and I'm not. I'm talking about Acts chapter 21. I didn't bring up the epistle of James. Uh, you're talking about the you're talking about the um the oath that Jesus that he told Paul to take. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, was that um th that's in no wise a prescription either. He just told him to do that for the sake of the people. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Uh, well, well, so we got divine. Gotta, divine real, that's kind of crazy, ahead. right there. Divine, because, real quick. Okay, go ahead, did brother. Did he not? Did he not literally say that? Um, 
that the people are going to come together and they're hearing that you're teaching people against the law of Moses. No, that was already the rumor. That was only the rumor going around. I showed you in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 on, that that was incorrect because Paul was not teaching Jews in his congregation to be uncircumcised and live without the law. He never taught that. That's not what Paul no. was teaching. Oh, oh, absolutely not. Why would he do that? These, this is their tradition. That's my point. But what Paul did teach, but what Paul did teach is that there is no justification in that and therefore there is no condemnation in it. okay so so that's why he said hold on wait ahead. wait wait this is why he said this is why he said in romans chapter 10 concerning those same people that they are ignorant of god's righteousness and they're still going wait 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 when you wait 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 wait, wait. Is let, he, me, let me finish let hold me on finish. wait I, so listen I, brother i just want clarity real quick i want you to finish i'm just saying you're saying that he's saying this to those Believe in Jews and Acts 21. Is this who he's talking? Is he saying no, that to? No, I'm oh, talking about okay. his overall doctrine concerning the Jews. He's letting, he's speaking about Israel and he's letting us know or letting the Israelites know because there were Israelites in that audience too. How do we know that? Because of Ro uh, Romans chapter 7, he was talking to the Jews who understood the law. And then when he got to Romans chapter 10, he's explaining to them that the Israelites, they're still going about trying to establish their own righteousness out of what? Moses' law. And he's saying they're ignorant of God's righteousness, his new way of trying to justify mankind. And he said in about verse 5, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. So there is no more justification for the believer in the law of Moses and his commandments, and therefore there is no condemnation in it. So there's no problem if a person, if Paul go ahead and take the Nazarite vow, it didn't matter one way or the other. And that's the reason why he's saying circumcision don't matter either, because that's literally the, the doctrine that they, he taught. So, no, he wouldn't teach them against keeping their traditions. That's why he wouldn't go to the Jews and say, yo, just eat whatever you want. He wouldn't do that because they were raised a certain way under and that that's, law. That's what I was saying. So, if so, the way you're saying it is like, that doesn't matter. Why would the Jews continue in the law if the law, according to what you're saying, contradicts the law of Christ? Big, no, it doesn't contradict the law of Christ. That's what I just because, said, brother. No, here's why. <laughs> because this is there, there's two different covenants, two different laws. Christ made it absolutely clear when he got on the scene. The law and the prophets were until John. That's where it stopped. That can't be right? the case because Jesus Paul, kept the law well, after listen, John died. Of course he had to keep the law because he was still living. But you said it was until John and John him. died and Jesus was still alive years after that. Oh, my goodness. Yes or no, brother? Listen, was that the case? Listen. All right, look, look, listen to this, right? Luke 16, verse 16. I say this all the time. I'm going to show you how it works. Okay. Uh, the law and the prophets were until John. That's what Jesus said. However, Jesus was born under the law. He had to fulfill the law uh, in order to bring justification to all men. So while he was still living under the law, alive, because he had to die a perfect, sinless man under the law he was establishing the new covenant and that's why he was given new commandments while he was alive and speaking to his disciples to keep when he died he sealed the new covenant with his blood so both had to both had to happen at the same time simultaneously he had to live under the law and he had to establish the new covenant while he was alive and that's why he said, a new commandment I give unto you while he was still living under the law. Because he had to die a perfect man under the law in order to redeem everybody that was under the law and bring justification through his name. It couldn't happen no other way, divine. He had to live under the law. Let me say it one more time for everybody that's kind of slow. And he had to establish the new covenant at the same time. And that's why he was giving them the new commandments while he was alive. It's not that difficult. I don't know why we make this. Okay, so so I don't I don't think nobody's slow in this room. All right. Um, so I think everybody's following. That doesn't mean I, did they I call agree. Anybody slow? I, yes, I you did. You said for those who are slow in this room, that's what you said. But it's okay. I it's okay. apologize. No, no, listen. Sincerely, I didn't mean to say that. Sometimes I do go hard good, and I troll, but I, if I did say that, I apologize. I didn't mean to nah, say it's that. Not, it's not. It's all good, right? And and that's why when you were saying I was doing too much earlier, I wasn't because everybody was following what I was saying. But when you go to Luke chapter 16, right, that you read in verse 16, that's what you read, right? Right. 
Okay. You said the law and the prophets were unto John. Can you explain to us what that means? What does that mean? Um, uh, uh, um, the law, and the, the law was their guide. The prophets did more than prophesy, so that had nothing to do with prophecy. Uh, we could go to Isaiah chapter one, and we see Isaiah calling them to repentance and literally preaching to them. Right. So the prophets, just like the law, were their guides. That's all that's saying. It's not speaking of prophecy because I know a lot of time people try to wrap that up. When it when it says it was real, until until John, what does that mean, brother? You're not explaining what that means. Oh, it it was their guide until they get to John. Meaning that's Wait, what. what mm -hmm. That's what. Okay, Paul said pretty much the same thing, just in other words. Paul said that the law was our schoolmaster, right? It was their guide to bring us unto Christ, and after that, we're no longer under the law. So again, divine. The only words I can find to explain that to you is that it were their, it was their guide. That's what directed them. But when John came on the scene, Jesus said that's where that stopped. Right now, that's the new righteous. Stopped. Yeah, okay. that's where it stopped. Now, now God is establishing His new covenant with new commandments. That's as simple as it could get. Now, if we get into verse seventeen, and you want me to explain that to you, how that okay? Works, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna I'm read, read this. I'm gonna read this, brother, because um, mm -hmm. and it's apparent. This is why I said, when there's a point of contention, there are ways in order to get deeper, right? Mm -hmm. To see if we're if we're part of the same tree, if we go down to the root, or if we're two completely different trees bearing two different kinds of fruit. I'm gonna read the context of Luke chapter sixteen, start at verse fourteen, and ended at seventeen, and I'm gonna explain it the way that I would exegete this, right? What you said, I, that's new to me. The Pharisees, verse 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And if we read in, in the book of Mark, uh, chapter seven, he talks about them taken the traditions of men over the commandments of God. The same phrase that Paul used in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14 that I brought it to you earlier. But let's keep going. Verse 16, the law and the prophets were unto John. Watch this, brother. You just got to keep reading. Since then, the good news of the kingdom is preached and everyone forces his way into it. You see what it says when it says the law and the prophets were unto John and since then, the good news of the God was the good news preached in the law. Yes or no? <laughs> Divine. That question was. I'm so... asking you. A, I'm asking you a yes or no question, brother. Um, the good news was it teach taught in the law? Is it preached um, in the law? Mm, I'm, I'm thinking real. I, I don't think I've seen it. In do you believe that? Do you believe what's called the Proto Evangelion, which is the first gospel, which is Genesis chapter three and verse fifteen? about the serpent having his head crushed by the, by the seed of the woman? Is that the gospel preached? Yes or no, brother? No, no, I don't think okay. that's the gospel. When Jesus says that Abraham was happy, excited to see my day, and he did, is that an example of the gospel being preached to Abraham? Yes or no, brother? The gospel preached to Abraham. Um, that yes, in his that, seed. That, that, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so that when that you go to the book gospel. of Numbers, when, when Balaam... It's making a prophecy about the scepter coming from out of Judah. Is that a messianic reference to the gospel that he would rule all peoples? Yeah, but we don't. We want to. Oh, okay, wait. Let me keep going, brother. brother I'm not done. Mind, before you, wait, wait. Before hold on, hold on, hold on, brother. Can I, can okay, I just go ahead, say brother. Something? Go ahead. Because you're ahead. moving really fast, bro. What? But we're talking about the good news of the gospel. We're not talking about um. Uh, something as ambiguous as the scepter coming. We're talking about what the gospel is, the good news, what, what what's going to be preached. I didn't finish, That's brother. That's what you're I'm... talking about. Let's talk about Yeah, that. yeah. So let's, so let's keep going. Go. Wait, 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 wait. Let's keep going. So all the times when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament to confirm or affirm the messianic prophecies that Jesus will be fulfilled, is that the gospel? Yes or no? Um, no, nah, the, the gospel is, is pretty clear. Uh, divine, we we like, uh, how about this, right? How about we we kind of get a description of what the gospel actually is? 
uh, I think you did kind of point one out, Genesis 3, and be shall all the nations be blessed, right, which is believing in Jesus Christ. Um, that is uh, a major part of the gospel, if if I wouldn't say the most important part of the gospel. But if we're going to get into the gospel, let's just get into the gospel and not play games with it. Brother, we're not playing games with it. So let's go. Let me show you. Let me show you what the gospel is. You ready? All right, let's go to Mark. Let's go to Mark chapter one, because brother, I'm just trying to show you that even in English, I didn't even go to the Greek because you're going to be, oh, you're going to the Greek. The English says the law and the prophets were until John. And then you have what's called the semicolon. And I know you want to know what a semicolon is, right? Because, you know, you so, so slow, can you, can you but we know wait, some wait, basics of English grammar. Wait, wait, um, wait, real and, quick, real quick. Okay, go ahead, brother. Can you explain to us what that until mean? That's, that's what I just said. It says, since then. The good news of the kingdom of God is preached. So, so let me ask Since you this: then, real quick before that period of time forward. from the law to John, the good news of the kingdom has been preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But so it let is me easy. Ask you this. Okay, go ahead, brother. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this: So when sure. he said that the law and the prophets were until John, what exactly does that mean to you? Exactly what he says that follows after that semicolon. So the semicolon. So they weren't. So 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 wait real quick. So they weren't no longer teaching. It, didn't, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. I'm just reading what the text says. It's talking about within the context of verse 16, the good news of the kingdom of God being preached. That's what it's talking about. Because when yeah, John yeah. came on the scene, wait wait. When John came on the scene, did Jesus was Jesus buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven? Did that happen? Did he die? get buried and resurrected? Did that happen when John was on the scene preaching? Did that happen in the lifetime of John before John died? Yes or no? No, no, absolutely okay. not. Gotcha. But, but so, wait, so wait, this real a... quick. So can I get a, can I get a one in? You moving fast like you, you acting nervous, my brother. Slow no, no, out, nervous. Right? Every Brother, everybody's following what I'm saying because John was a prophet after the other prophets, which was calling the people unto repentance so they can enter into the kingdom of God. Make He said, make repentance. Fruits meet for repentance. The axe is laid at the root and the tree is going to fall down. And that means that the tree has to be secured from the fruit that's on it. And he was saying this to the Pharisees. He was preaching the gospel all the way up into his point. And everybody was trying to press into it because the gospel was being preached from the law, which I was trying to show you in the first five books of Moses and the rest of the Tanakh, which I didn't even get into yet, to show you where the gospel was being preached all throughout there until John. He is the last prophet that is preaching the good news before the elements of the good news is fulfilled in Jesus. Yeah, but Brother. that's not that we don't have. Listen, wait, Devon, we don't have no contention with what <laughs> with the gospel being preached in that, right? What the contention? We're trying to figure out Luke sixteen verse sixteen, right? What Jesus meant by the law and the prophets were until John. So let me. Uh, that's what I'm saying. We're moving real fast. So let me ask you this, right? When these folks came to John. Oh, when, when these folks came to John, I gotta hurry up. When we, when these folks came to John and asked him, "What shall I do?" Uh, I'd have to go and see the exact question that they that they asked is John. But I think you can pull it up for me. Uh, I think the the soldiers came and asked them, "Uh, what?" Man, I gotta look at it real quick, Divine. Let me look at it because I want to ask you specifically from what was going on right here with John. Oh, take your time, my brother. Take your time. Uh, give me one second. Let me pull it up. It's then the soldiers. I gotta Google it. So give me one second. Cause we want to figure this out. Then the soldiers. Damn. Like. Hey, when we get a chance, man, we gotta talk about. I want to talk about that he lie that Luke and Matthew. Yeah, All no right, problem. Uh, um, I, I, when I finish with Jay, you can definitely do that, Jody. Um, I do have to leave in a few minutes because it's it, I got to go to work in three and a half hours. Um, yeah, I got to so, leave too. Don't worry, we'll, we'll we'll catch back up on this topic. No, 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 no. Right, we're gonna finish. Yeah. We're gonna finish this last point, and then yeah. I'm gonna hand it over to Jody and let Jody take it from there. All right, and the crowd's questioning him, saying, "Now what? Do, what we? What do we need to do?" All right, so okay, so here we go, right? So. The crowds, after, you know, John spoke about judgment, right? And calling the scribes and Pharisees uh, vipers and all that. Watch this. He, this is what he said, right? Where, where you at? Where you at? Uh, Luke 3. Luke 3. I'm going to start at okay, verse 10 because this is the crowd, right? 
and the crowd because he's speaking he's preaching repentance right listen what the crowd said and the crowds were questioning him saying then what are we to do and he would answer and he would answer and say to them the one who has two tonics is to share with the one who has none and the one who has food is to do likewise now even tax collectors came to be baptized and they said to him teacher what are we to do remember he speak he's preaching repentance right oh yeah what are we to do and he said to them collect no more than what you have been ordered to and the soldiers also were questioning him saying what are we to do so we got three people asking him questions about what they should do concerning repentance do not extort money from anyone nor harass anyone and be content with your wages now divine i'm sure we can go into the law and we can find something in the law that probably teaches brothers not to do and to do some of the things that uh some of the things that's being questioned here right so divine my question to you is if if it was the law that was supposed to be uh imposed on these individuals why didn't he just make it simple because he grew up under the law himself and just say keep the law of moses okay now can i speak we good oh yeah you got it but remember my question so so wait wait brother 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 this is all predicated on luke chapter 16. so let's let's get some context okay luke chapter 3 and verse 3 and he went into all the region around the jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the beginning of sins watch verse 4 as it is written in the book of the words of isaiah the prophet the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord make his path straight every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of god so wait 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 hold on hold on brother brother Did hold on oh. can i ask my question brother, again because you went brother I, I heard i heard your question and i'm gonna get to what you read about why don't he just tell him to keep the law so mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a, we're gonna go to the same thing where jesus spoke the sermon on the mount in mark chapter five right six and seven right and he didn't say that to him either but yet in matthew chapter 5 and 17 not only did he say he didn't come to destroy the law but fulfill it and that until heaven and earth pass away not one jot or tell will fall away from the law and he goes in matthew chapter 23 and tells the people jesus says this right because remember this context this book is not about john it's just about jesus but jesus says in matthew chapter 23 that the Pharisees are in the seat of Moses. Do what they tell you to do. But let me get back to Luke chapter three. The salvation, we shall see the salvation of our God is what Jesus is going to fulfill. So all the prophets was teaching the same thing until John, which is what we're reading right here. He even quotes Isaiah. And then he goes on and says to them, he said, therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? This is language that is similar to the major prophets. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to, from these stones, raise children from Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He is coming in the same vein as the prophets before him. This is when it says until John, Jesus is the fulfillment of what they all preached, which is the gospel of the kingdom. Now, as we jump down to answer your question, I'm trying to give you context for Luke chapter 16, verse 16. And we go down to verse 10 and the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? Now, you know what repentance is, brother? What is repentance? Because this is all connected. What is repentance? Um, I tell you to repent. What does that mean? Uh, I think Zacchaeus was like the, the perfect example of repentance. Uh, Zacchaeus gave up his greed for generosity, and he uh, he decided he wasn't going to steal no more. There you so go. Just- so wait, 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 brother. So, so, so here we go. Let me answer your question. This is focused on not teaching the law. He's a prophet telling the people to repent because it's already agreed based on even what you said, that the people understood that these are basic tenets from the law. So we go to verse... 11 and he answered them whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none and whoever has food is to do likewise these are tenants from the law 
that you are to make sure your brother is clothed and fed. Apparently, the people were not doing that, and that's why he had to correct them. Repentance means you turn away from one divergent path and get back on the intended path. Meaning that if you steal something, there's restitution. You got to pay it back. If you hurt somebody, there's restitution. You got to pay it back. Right? He goes into verse 12 and says, Tax collectors also can be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? Look what he says. And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Because obviously, brother, they're not doing that. So he is telling them what they should do. This is repentance. But, but, so. So let me ask you this. You think while it was in the synagogues on Saturdays and reading. How you go law, to the synagogue from this? He's in no, the wilderness, on, no, brother. No, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because go ahead. I'm, I'm trying to show you what's actually happening here. Okay. You don't think that this was explained to them from the from the time they were growing up out of the law, from their parents and the, the scribes and the Pharisees. You don't think they understood that they weren't supposed to do that? Brother, what do, what do you think the prophet's job is? And the Tanakh, you don't think the Jews knew what they should be doing, but they were doing brother, the brother, thing. Brother, wait, 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 wait. Letter... No, no, brother, listen, brother. Listen, you asked the question. You said, shouldn't they already know? Brother, I can know what my parents tell me to do and still not do it. What are you talking about? And somebody comes along and says to me who is not my parents, hey, brother, you should not be doing that. This is what you should do. You know, what you, you know how your parents raised you. Why are you not doing what your parents raised you to do? You're doing the wrong thing. Obviously, brother, I should already know that. But the purpose of the prophet is because the people got so steep and turning away from the law and obedience to the creator and keeping the commandments of God. The prophets had to come to turn the people's heart back to God. That was their job, brother. That was John's job. That was Isaiah's job. That was Ezekiel's job. That was Noah. I mean, not Noah, excuse me, Jonah I said Jonah, Noah. Jonah's job. Right. That was Daniel's job when he prayed for his people. Right. That was Hosea's job. Right. So all the prophets were telling the people who was in a downtrodden state to repent. Repentance is something that they also understood, which means I'm doing something wrong. Now I'm being told to go back and do what's right. So, so look, look, Divine, I was really trying to spare you, hoping that you would have caught it. That's why I asked you, why didn't he just tell him to keep the law of Moses? Because as soon as Jesus get on the scene, you see similar you see the you see similar things happening. For instance, when Jesus in Matthew, I believe in Matthew chapter five, he started speaking to them. He said, "You know, it was said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery." Right? That's what Moses said. Don't commit adultery. It's in his law. He said, "But I say unto you, if you look at a woman and lust after, her, you've already committed the sin in your heart." What's actually happening here, divine? Because it's not that hard to understand. Like I was telling you earlier. The new covenant was being set up according to Jeremiah 31. These laws are going to be written on your heart. No, so give me a second. Listen, listen to this now, divine. You cannot go nowhere in Moses law and find that commandment. That was yes, just I can. Given. Yes, I can. Let me give it to you. Slow, slow down right there. Let me give it to you. Let me know when you're ready for it. You ready? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right, here we go. Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to jump down to verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Or Man. his male servant. Let me let me finish, brother. Or his Divine, female slow, slow down, brother, slow brother, down. brother, brother, you, brother, that was brother. So slow, off. Let, let, no, ahead, no, 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 no. Go ahead, because you so let, off. Let, go ahead, brother. Go ahead, brother. Go or ahead. his no female problem. servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is his neighbor's. <laughs> what does it mean that you should not covet your neighbor's wife? It don't mean lust. What does it Jesus mean that you shall not covet your neighbor's look, wife? Okay, look, look, look. I can, I can look. I can see my neighbor's wife and be like, man, I would want her. I would want that donkey. <laughs> don't mean I'm a, look, yo, look, you, you just listen, killed yourself yo listen, brother listen, this listen. is suicide hold, on, brother. hold on hold on you know as well as i do when jesus said uh um um sorry about that one second i'm in the office i don't want to get too loud you know just as well as i do jesus was speaking in reference to a sexual thought he wasn't speaking about just a desire he was thinking sex and that's the reason why he addressed the adultery first because they were they may not have been doing it like physically the, the, the action had manifested but they were thinking about it divine so i know you you are a very intelligent brother don't play with people's intelligence in here. Brother, you know when Jesus said, if you look in lust, he's talking about them thinking about having sex with the woman. Divine, stop playing games, bro. You know better than that. Am I right or wrong? Was he speaking uh, just a desire or a sexual thought? <laughs> Divine. Divine. Yo, Jay, 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 hold on, brother. 
brother, brother. Divine, real quick. Divine, when Jesus said that, right? Because he literally uh, made reference to the law. Was he talking about them holding a sexual thought in their mind or just a desire for some somebody's goods or just to take somebody's wife? Brother, what, what is the def listen, brother, what is the definition of lust? Desire. An inordinate hold affection towards hold on. Well, hold on, brother, listen. An illicit, inordinate affection towards something. Now that's very important that you understand that. When you say the nah, word nah, covet, wait, wait, wait. But can you okay, answer okay. my question though before you ask me another Brother. question? Because I, I want to get to the meat of the matter here. Like, can you answer my question? Was he if you're lusting about... after somebody's wife, brother, are you coveting? Yes or no? Um, yeah, in a sense. <laughs> I'm done. I'm here, done, here, brother. Here, I love you, on. brother, but I don't, don't think you're seeing what's going yet. on, brother. Don't get don't get done yet. Let's speak to the spirit and what Jesus was actually trying to convey. When he said, you know of them of, he said, you know what was said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery, right? What is he talking about there? What 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 commandment was he speaking in, in reference of? Would you like me to give it to you? Yes, but Exodus don't, don't chapter, be too long Exodus, I got a follow-up question. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Is that simple enough right. for you? Does that answer so, the so, question? So that's the... Most time messing up his mic right now. It's crazy. And we all over the place, Devon. <laughs> yeah, he's Gucci. I mean, um, I understand what he's saying, but I don't think he realized that by him acquiescing to what I'm saying, he is he's contradicting himself. So the word for covet, right? So there's two different things, right? So Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 is the actual action, the act. Yo, Devon, can you hear Exodus. Me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. My gym partner word trying to figure out where I'm at. Hold on. Yeah, yeah take your time. Take mic. your time. Ooh, me too, Jay. Yeah, yeah we're gonna end off on this because Jay's yeah, so, Jay's you trying to work out right now, right, Jay? No, nah, I'm about to go to the gym. Okay, cool. Get off work. No, yeah, look, you you right, about to get a workout right now. You're getting worked out right now, brother. You could probably nah, tip the gym. No, no. What's actually get some sleep. Is you twisted the scriptures. So look, so when 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 uh when Jesus when Jesus said, when he, when he, uh, I'm trying to get ready at the same time. So when Jesus added the second portion of that scripture, but I say unto you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, what is that? Is that speaking of just covetousness from the context of the scripture you just read? Or he's talking about somebody literally committing the act of adultery from thought. Brother, is that the same thing as covering somebody's wife? Man, answer my question. How you gonna answer my question with another question, brother? You know better than that. Brother, is that also covering somebody's wife? No, you if can't. You lust, listen, listen, let me answer your question, brother, because you'll see lust and covet is the same thing. But and you don't like to look at the original language. That's fine. Listen, brother, if you look at somebody's wife and you don't commit the act, right, but it's done in your heart, is that coveting? Wait, wait, listen, listen, Divine. It's going to get worse for you when I actually do get into the law about that, because there is no stoning for anybody committing adult, um, committing adultery in their heart. There is not one law that says you could die for getting stoned, uh, for thinking about another man's wife. But Moses did write in his law that adultery, the act, can get you stoned. So we gonna, if we get into the intricacies of this situation, you really gonna be in trouble. So you could just bow out now, or we can continue. So did Jesus say that if nah, you lust nah. in your heart after somebody's wife, that you're going to get stoned? Is that what Jesus said? No, nah, no, nah, absolutely not. Because this new covenant is set up kind of different. I'm just trying to get you to see the difference between what Moses got going on and what Jesus got going on. That's all I'm doing. But you won't be honest with what, what's in front of you. You just won't. So, go, okay. So can, all right, let me just deal with what, what you're bringing out, right? Can you um read that text that you just read that you said that's what Jesus was speaking in reference to? One more time, please. Sure. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife mm -hmm. or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Okay. So you know how I know that uh, you're kind of like conflating 
because Moses in one scripture is uh in one passage of this uh, of the law is telling you that adultery you get stoned for it right and over here he's talking about just simply desiring what your neighbor has so he's not gonna he's not just gonna simply apply just destroying an individual piling rocks on top of them because uh they slept with somebody and then over in the next passage of scripture say to you well listen if you're thinking about this woman's wife it's okay like absolutely it's not well it's not okay but there's no consequences at all to it you just he's just telling you not to do it as if he's just preaching to you so you, you're gonna have to pick one is he saying that uh that um is he speaking to the the, the thought of uh sleeping with another man's wife or he's just simply telling you not to just desire him? just like the, the rest of the stuff because then we'd have to apply a sexual act to the rest of the things that he just told you not to uh covet same word All right, so um, so Jay, you you do do word studies, right? Um, yeah, from time to time when I need to. Okay, so in um, in Matthew chapter five that you brought up, right? Uh, do you have the do you have the uh, the uh, wherewithal to look it up right now in Matthew chapter five that you're referencing, or are you actually in the middle of something? If not, I can just look it up for you. I can, but I don't think that's even that's necessary because the no no it is because we're going to find out why. what we're talking about. Here's here's why. Um, here's why because the context actually kind of just clear that up for you. Like we don't really need to do it. Um, the first thing he mentioned is the act of adultery, right? And then the second thing he gets into is, uh, thinking or lusting in your heart and then sin. Like that's why okay. we don't. Need to. So we know we real quick. The reason why I, listen, the reason why I said that is because maybe you're not aware, but the same word in the Septuagint for Exodus twenty and seventeen is the same word Jesus uses in Matthew chapter five and verse twenty eight. Maybe maybe you're not maybe you're not aware of that, but maybe you should go back and actually say that for yourself. It's very it's very it's very important that you actually at least do a word lookup. And I don't think you did it in this case, but it's the same root, brother. It's just inflected differently. It's the same root. One second, one second, even, man. Get you get my car. It's cold to sell out. Man. Go ahead. You can keep talking. I can hear you. No. So, so what I'm saying is, it's the same word in the Greek. <laughs> this is, brother. This is this is this is really insane. And I understand why you don't want to go to sources outside of just a cursory reading of the bible because when you do brother it will correct certain things that you assume to be true or presume to be true but when you actually go to the actual language the words don't lie it's the same word matter of fact anybody on here right now what i'm going to do is i'm going to post a link for everybody to go and see this for themselves so don't think that i'm you know just being deceitful i'm gonna post a link right here in the chat Right. This is for everybody to see. Everybody click on that link. Keep that in one tab. And now I'm going to post for you the lexicon for this word that's used there in the Greek. And you can go to verse 17. Make sure you have the interlinear so you can see the word that's being used there. And I'm going to go for you. I'm going to give to you the lexicon. And what you're going to see in the lexicon from the Septuagint is it's going to look for occurrences in the New Testament. And one of the occurrences of that same word is in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28. I mean, this is this is this is crazy. This is crazy. I'm trying to tell you, brother, that word covet is the same word in Exodus 2017 that Jesus is using in Matthew 5 and 28. It's the same word. It's the same word. It means lust. It's the same word. Brother, it's the same word, brother. I posted the link for everybody in the audience to look for themselves. You ain't got to believe me. It's the same word. Dre, okay. So I'm you got it, Jay, right? I'm gonna bow out, right? Let me let me hand it over to Jody. Um, you can continue the conversation if you like, but it's late for me. I gotta go to bed. This was fun. I appreciate it. But brother, please, when you get some time, please go and look at Exodus 20 and 17 and Septuagint. Look for the word that's there for covet and go look at the same Greek word in Matthew 5 and 28 for lust and see if it's the same word. That's all I'm saying, brother. Okay. Will you do that when you get time? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, All right. I'm actually looking at it now. I just got on my car's coat. 
All right, so, but, but Divine, he, here's the thing, right? I think you just want to, you, you want to ignore that the lust in here is, um, is, is about sex because it's in direct, uh, it's in direct correlation to the act that Jesus said they were, they weren't doing, but they were thinking about doing right. I mean, look, I can desire my, I can desire, I can lust after my neighbor's wife because she looked good, but I can listen to their arguments all day and how this lady treats this man and not want to be with her, like not wanting to take her and marry her. That that's definite. I can definitely do that. I can just want to have sex with your wife, but not necessarily want to take her and make her my wife. And so when Jesus gave that commandment, he's just simply talking about sex. Don't think about sleeping with another woman. You kind of get what I'm saying? Does that make sense, Devon? Brother, <laughs> I hear what you're saying. And what I'm trying to simply show you <laughs> I is don't... Exodus 20 and 7 is saying the same thing. Do not lust after your neighbor's wife. No, no, no. Covetousness, covetousness gives the uh the notion that a person want to have ownership. You would you like you okay? When I when I covet somebody's car, like I, I want to have that car. I don't just want to drive the car, but I want to own the car. Right? That's that's the notion of the word covetous. Like I want to have possession of that. But lusting, like. I, Brothers lust after whores all the time, but brothers don't never really want to don't want to marry a whore and make her and take possession as if this woman is his, his wife and he's going to walk around. Whore. No, divine, you know better than that. There's a lot of women who brothers would not marry, but they would love to to deal with sexually and sometimes lust after them. So we don't want to mix the two contexts here. Jesus is simply saying, whether you want to marry her or not, don't think about sleeping with her. Period. Moses is saying, don't want to, don't want to take possession of your mother, uh, of your neighbor's wife. Would you disagree with that? The word, uh, the word, the word possession is not the end. Exodus twenty and seventeen. I don't know why you're no. adding words to it. Wait, no, listen, no, brother, that's listen, not what brother, I. That's brother. not what I'm saying. That is divine. what you said. Okay. No, brother. divine. Hold on. That's not what I said. I didn't say the word. I said the word covet. That's the notion that the word coven, or that would be the interpretation of that word, taking possession. If you're gonna covet something that somebody has, it means that you want to possess it. But Jesus is just saying, don't lust. Don't think about sleeping with somebody. That's all it's saying. I, I don't know why you're trying to mix the two, Divine. Brother, you realize that the Christians in the chat don't even agree with you right now? I don't care. Listen, what that got to do with me? No, it, it has to do with this. The but the next what, man, no, no, listen, brother. It's that the consensus is even those who oppose my personal biases are not agreeing with your exegesis of the passage simply because it's using the same Greek word. The, are you yeah. understanding all right, all right. that, brother? Jay, he right, not look, can somebody me. jump in and, and explain that? Okay, I'm going to be quiet. He's he not talking about me, Jay, because I'm not following the conversation. Say that again, Christina? He's not talking about me because I'm not following the conversation. I just want to make that disclaimer. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask the Christians that's on stage. Maybe you are. Okay, ask, ask, Chris, ask, ask Christina. Ask, let me ask Christina. Let me ask you a question. Sorry, Hold I, on. I, I've been tripping with Halima, man. We <laughs> after after a certain time, I just be checking out. But um. yeah, okay. <laughs> so, All right, so 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 Christina, the word the word covetous, right? When a, when a person is is covetous, does yeah. the, doesn't the word covetous mean or would give the notion that somebody would want to take possession of what the other person has? Yeah, like covetousness. Y'all trying to do the, the the nuance between covetousness and lust? Yeah. And so, well, between the two passages that we're dealing with now. Right. So covetousness is um, thou shalt not covet like your neighbor's ass versus if you look upon a lady in lust. Is that is that what we're talk talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Those two texts, those two texts, yeah. All right. So here's the problem. Um I don't know when he's saying that those are the same word. Let me just ask Devon real quick. Are you talking about in the Septuagint, brother? 
Yes, sis. So you probably were just clowning in the chat. So you probably wasn't following the dialogue. Yeah. But I, but I, I showed I, I to him. Hold on. Hold on. Let me let me explain. Said. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah, I, 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 I shared with him. I shared with him. I shared with him the Septuagint uh, passage, right? For Exodus 20 and 17. I gave everybody the lexeme that's used there. And then I showed everybody that the lexeme is used also in Matthew chapter 5. It is the same Greek word. He's trying to tell me, he's trying to tell okay, me it means so, something else. And I'm telling him it's the same Greek well, word. I'll post the links denied. again in the chat so, for you. So two, two things could be true. And so here's the problem. <laughs> what? No. I'm okay, serious. sis, go ahead. Two, two things could be true because just because something has the same actual word does not mean that it's using it in the same context or connotation. So it could be the same Greek word, like how a card, and we fight over that all the time. A card has, can, you know, is, is a card. But a card can mean one in unity or it can mean one numerically. So the same thing with the word. like just because What? It's just, just because it's the same word, it does not mean it means the same thing. What does that have to do? That's why Genesis, sis, what does that have to do with Exodus 20 and 17 divine, don't try, and Matthew 5 and 28? I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that there is a nuance in the difference between covetousness and lust. It could be the same word. It don't mean it has the same exact connotation. Prove that. That's what I'm saying. Prove it. All right. I'm going to read from so you. Wait, talk. wait. What I'm going to do also, just so that people can see that I'm not being biased, I'm going to read from you the Zondervan exegetical commentary of the book of Matthew. And we're going to see from a linguist. Wait, 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 no, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. You say there's million, but this is an exegetical commentary. It's I don't, not the. I, I don't the, care. Hold there's on. hundreds of sis, those. Sis, 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 sis. No, it's not hundreds of those. Listen yes, to me, is. sis. Right? No, yes, it's not. Is. No. Okay. Like Send me the hundred ones that you know. They come Send me with, a, with many people no, who make. No, commentary. no, they do not come. They, okay, sis. So. So I'm aware that you're not familiar with exegetical commentaries. No, There's not hundreds not of them that exist. That. You like to try to yeah, I, no, 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 and Sis, so now listen. you're trying to get emotional. No, 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 that. no. You're doing the like, most unnecessarily, sis. I don't want to hear from nobody, Divine. Okay, listen to me. Listen to me, right? And you said you, you were made a, You can leave. Oh, here we go. And we can continue no. to have the conversation. First of all, I'm a mod, so I'm not leaving until I'm ready to leave. Okay. That's number one. So you lied. Number two, I was, wait, you, no, I didn't lie. I did not lie. I did not lie. See, now you're being disrespectful. What is all of that for? You try to get big off of other people. Why are you doing all of that? What what do you, what are you what you is this coming from? Nobody was saying you, won't you came on here and started a whole contention Jay, that wasn't even there between me and Jay. And now he won't let me finish my. Yeah, answer. I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. No, you out asked me a question. No, I did not. No, you said Christina. Let's ask you. And now you don't like what no, I said, no. and so now it's, you're trying to railroad. It's not. It's not that I don't so like what you said, brother. But, hey, 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 divine. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it be fair to let her let her finish answering the question, though, brother? Before you get into all that. Because remember, you said the Christian was disagreeing I with mean, me. Well, we we got two on stage and that's why I'm that can actually agree or disagree. Go ahead, and read your commentary, brother, from another man. And, I'm and a, I'm a, at this point, word. at this point, sis, no, no, it's not. It's not about that. It's about decorum. I was being respectful with Jay. I was not being no pseudo intellect and no. You read commentaries, just simply dismissing something does not gloss over the truth. And what I'm simply trying to demonstrate with you is I that the same you word the two is different used. Definitions, brother, and you can just let me finish. And Man. it takes two minutes to do that before you read a commentary. That's all I'm saying. It's really simple. You trying to make it deep? It's not that deep. So lust does have a sexual connotation. It's a strong desire in a sexual connotation. Yes, that's what lust is, right? Usually, like when we hear the connotation in English, that's what lust is. Where covetous is when you're having an indulgent or a desire for something that's just immodest. It could be anything. It could be in general. So lust is a specific type of covetedness. That's all I wanted to say. It's a little, they're closely related. They're not one in the same. They're not the same thing. Even if they are the same word, we know that love has the same word it has four different meanings. You see what I'm saying? Like we, I'm just saying like, we got to, you know, like, we know what Jay's saying. Ain't need to try to play like we don't know what the brother's saying. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying divine is wrong. That's why I said two things can be true at the same time. Yes, it's the same word, but it is a little nuanced with the word. They're not one in the same. 
they're not always synonymous or interchangeable like that. Well, I, I tried my best. Uh, Divine, you got it, brother. We, we'll talk another time. I'm about to get ready to get in here putting this work. Uh, we can pick up from the same topic, too. I think that uh, we need to hash this out. What Moses is saying in the law, um, based on that passage you just read about co coveting your neighbor's wife, donkey, and all of the other things that they got, and what Jesus is trying to convey in Matthew 5, 28. Same word, the connotation has changed based on the context. We can fix that uh, next time we talk. Most brother. definitely, and this is how you know the context is different, Jay, because if you say covet not your neighbor's ass, how could you lust after a donkey sexually? It's not that's not a connotation of sex. I literally you, said that to him like ten minutes, like about ten minutes ago. I was using a urinate at my job, and I say, look, if we're gonna we're gonna look at this passage as if that word lust means sex, then we're gonna have to say that this man is he want to have sex with this man material possession. I literally said that to him, and if he's still in here, he can testify to that. And that's what I don't like. I just don't like people trying to act like they don't know what you're talking about, like. It, like that's a that's a play you feel me so i don't gotta come for the brother in any disrespectful way but i just i peep what he do and i don't like that because it's not necessary if your knowledge speaks for itself let it speak you don't have to play off of the chat you don't have to play off of the information coveting a donkey is different than lusting after a woman in your heart two different total different contexts one in somebody's life in their lifestyle in their wife right is different than lusting after your wife and wanting to have sex with your wife and discard your wife that's two different things you see what i'm saying like right, right. we all we all like we all got common sense in here and we all i mean webster can can uh weed that out a commentary don't gotta weed that out for us yeah, that, that was pretty clean and clear to me i i, I don't know why we'd have to argue about that because the context would give the notion of the of the word or the understanding of the word Hey, Divine, listen, uh, Christina and everybody else that's on stage, man, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Yeah, I, I was leaving. All right, so I appreciate, I appreciate the conversation, Jay. Um, I'm not going to argue with a woman, right? So I'm going to let Christina say what she's going to say. Come I'm not on, keep going. come on, no, Divine. No, let me, let me talk. Now, you're cutting me off. You're cutting me off. You're cutting me off. You're cutting me off. And I didn't right, say fault, anything while y'all were talking. I was very my respectful, fault. and I cut my mouth shut. My what fault, I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, Jay, me and you were having an amicable discussion with no name calling, no ad hominems, right? We just had a conversation, right? And respectfully, even though we disagreed, there was no name calling. I respect that. And then Christina came in because we we, we allowed her to come in to say a part because she was defending your position and I have no problem with that, right? But the moment that I began to speak, then I got cut off. And that's what happens all the time when other people are coming in, when I'm going to say something, right? I get cut off. I understand your notion, Christina, and in some cases that is correct, but that's not the case here. For example, you made a and it, oh, let me let you go, Jay. I appreciate that, Jay. Let me finish with Christina, and just like Jay said, he had to go twice as well. He still stayed on the stage, but nobody called him any names. But that's fine, Jay. I will see you in the future, brother. We will have a conversation. All right. So I'm gonna finish what I was saying to you, Christina, because you directed something towards me, and I was quiet when you spoke. Right. And you I don't I don't know where all of that came from, but that's fine. You mentioned the word love. OK, love is an English translation. If you go to John chapter 20. Right. Let me pick up and put up John chapter 20. Right. I just want to show you this is not the same Greek word there for love. Matter of fact, I translators, know for love, Devon. Translate, do that. let me that's let me I'm talk, sis. I didn't cut Agape, you off. Let me talk. Phileo. You don't got to do that, Divine. That's all I'm saying. This is what I'm saying you don't have to do. You did it, but I can't get, do it. That doesn't make any sense. You don't sense. have to get big off me, brother. Who's getting big off you? What are you Greek talking words, about? Let me I talk. Let me talk, sis. I let, you, I let you speak. Let me speak. You're off please. topic. You're hey, off Christina, topic. Let's just let, let's just let I'll, him I'll let him speak. Saying. I just don't like him trying yeah. to act like he educated me on something I already know, Halima. That's but she was doing that to me. He was doing that to me. He can say it to the audience. Don't say it to me. That's all I'm right. saying. Right. Well, like I'm not playing just, those games. Let's just like let's just be on mute so that way he can finish. Right. What he's just tell him to direct it to somebody respond else. To That's all I'm saying, Halima. We good. Right. Right. You can respond if you do. And I was joking. I was in a good mood. They invited me into the conversation. Yeah. 
No, I'm saying let's just let Devon finish what he's saying and then you can respond. Yeah, just say it to you know somebody saying, else. After he's done, I already let him, know, let him land. Yeah, just let him land. Go ahead. Wow. So somebody can say something to me directly and I receive it, but the moment I speak back to them, I'm not allowed to do that. This is this is incredible, but you brought up love. I didn't bring love up. You brought that up and you don't have to take you to mean you directly if you don't want me to speak to you. That's fine. So I'm going to say it based on what occurred. So what occurred was I was told, well, the word can be the same, but have two different meanings. That's what I was told. And then what you see applying here is somebody taking the word covet and juxtapose it against the word lust in English. But when we go to the Greek and look at its usage in both cases, it's the same. And then I was told, well, just like the word love. Well, in, in the word love, there's different words for love. Matter of fact, just calling something love is not expressing the nuance in the Greek. And that's what happens when you rely on a translation. This is why I was telling Jay, if you go back to the Greek word and the Septuagint for Exodus 20 and 17, it's using the same word in the same sense that you find in Matthew chapter five and verse 28. I gave the sources so people can look it up for themselves. So people won't see that I'm being biased or talking out the side of my mouth. And what I say still stands, unless somebody can show me that the application of that same word being used in the same sense in Exodus 20 and 17 in the Greek is contrasted to what we see in Matthew chapter five and verse 28, then I will stand corrected. However, that has not been done. And so, like I said earlier to Jay, that sometimes we'll come into a point of contention and notice I didn't call nobody out their names. We get to a point of contention where now we have to go look for something deeper to try and mediate what the point of contention is to see if there's common ground. I made a suggestion to say, okay, I'm going to go to a unbiased source, which is a Christian author of an exegetical commentary, not a standard Bible commentary, an exegetical commentary, which there's not thousands of them, right? And I wanted to read for one so that people can see what's happening in the language of Matthew chapter five and verse 28. And what we see what's happening in the language of the Septuagint in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. And when you see what this says, it agrees with what I'm saying. The word covet in Exodus 20 and 17 in Septuagint is the word lust. The same lusting, something that is illicit, something that you are not supposed to do and or have. When it talks about Exodus 20 and 17, you will not see no Christian commentary that will say that in Exodus 20 and 17, that when it says do not covet your neighbor's ass, it's referring to sex with the donkey. They were juxtaposed it differently. When you lust after certain things, you lust after certain things differently. If you're lusting after your neighbor's wife, that means you want to take her in some way, shape, form, or fashion and have her. It's inordinate. If you lusting after somebody's ass or their donkey or their property, it's obvious that you're not trying to have sex with it. You're trying to take it as yours. You are desiring it illicitly because the text is telling you not to do that. Jesus is telling the people you are too hinged and hooked up on the actual physical act. When I'm telling you that if you lust in your heart, if you lust in your heart after your name is like, you have committed adultery. This is why you see in Exodus 20, it tells you not just the act, but it's a cover off for everything else, including the lustful desire, the illicit in order and affection to do something that is not yours to do it with. That is all I was conveying and have yet for, for me to be told to look in a Webster's dictionary, which is a dictionary for English words, when we both know the text is written in the Greek, and I'm trying to go to the Greek and show you somebody who is not biased to my position, explain to it in the Greek, they'll tell you if you go into the Septuagint of Exodus 20 and 17, it's being used in the same sense. But I was told, oh, you can go ahead and read man's commentary and man's this, but that wasn't, that wasn't the purpose. I was just trying to demonstrate something. I'm not here to disrespect you, Sister Christina. I'm not here to disrespect Jay. That was not my intention. We was having a dialogue, even though we disagree, it was amicable. 
There was no name calling. So there was no, oh, you trying to run game on me. Nobody's doing that. We're just talking. Okay, Devon. I'm trying to figure out what's coming on. So, Devon, I appreciate you and your patience. And I will give you an apology. I just get annoyed real fast, especially after midnight. I really do. And so, after all you just said, brother, you we still just aggressively agreeing. Like, you might don't like the way, you might want to say it uh more eloquently you might want to draw it out like you said something different but you just said the same thing the brother said and what i said and i said and i started off by saying two things could be true and i did not cut you off you invited me into the conversation but i'm not going to justify my misbehavior i will say this i do apologize for mishandling you i get annoyed by that though i'm not gonna lie like i understand you're trying to act like uh, this is some kind of humility. I'm not throwing no shots. But you could have agreed with the brother if you wanted to. You didn't want to agree with the brother. Like, you know what he's saying. Even if he doesn't uh, have as many tools in his in his box as you do. And then you're trying to play him, acting like Christians in the chat, uh, disagreeing with him and stuff. Like, that's all. I'm just saying, I, I just peep your play. That's all I'm saying. I do believe you are knowledgeable. I'm not going to, we're not going to disagree on the things that we agree on. I told you I agree. I agree with Divine and I also agree with Jay. I said two things could be true. So let me just give you a sincere apology. I did not have to be aggressive. Did not have to add harm or uh, insinuate that you were a liar or that you're a snake or anything like that. I just think that's what the doctrine does to people for real. But at the same time, I understand that you probably wasn't looking for that. You did invite me to this conversation. I just want you to know. And it just did seem like you got a little uh, interesting once I didn't agree with you and your position right off. So I'm just saying this to say, I did agree it's the same word. Never disagree with that. I did agree that lust comes under coveting. I said that as well. And all you did was just turn around and just say the same thing I said. I would love in sincerity if you would just say when people agree, if as black people, we could just say, you know what, sis, you're right. I can walk with you there. Yeah, you're right. I agree with you there. But we got to create this false uh, division and dichotomy that's not there. And so it's like, if we want smoke, I know how to bring smoke. You want to disagree? Well, I know how to disagree and be disagreeable. We don't got to disagree. Like we knew what Jay was saying, even if Jay couldn't, even when he was saying covetousness wrong, right? We don't got to do the man like that because he's saying the word wrong. We know exactly what he mean. That's it. But we on a, a app, an audio app. We need to be able to articulate ourselves. We need to be able to maintain decorum. So you're right, Halima. I was in a good mood. I was just joking. I didn't want to get into this nuanced conversation because you were trying to get deep about something that's not that deep. You know what I'm saying? But the way you just broke down the lust and the desire and the heart and the adultery, right? I think that was extremely accurate. And that's still something different, which you admit it is a different kind of covetousness, a different kind of lust than lusting and coveting somebody's donkey. You said that out of your own mouth. And that was my only point. So I apologize, brother, because I don't care what, uh, how annoyed or um, what my pet peeve is or whatever. It's not about me. I should not have mishandled you like that. And just, you know, I, I, I just, you know, anybody, I woke up in the room from their good sleep. I apologize to you too. And uh, I appreciate y'all. I was leaving probably like 10 minutes ago myself. So we good. I appreciate that. And I forgive you, right? It's not, I don't have any angst against you. Um, if you was listening to the conversation when me and Jay was having, that you admitted that you were not following because you were in the chat. Right, you'll see that we had a point of contention when it came to Exodus 20 and 17 and Matthew 5 and 28. The point that he made was you won't see anywhere in the law Matthew 5 and 28. That's what he was saying. He said, you won't find that anywhere in the law. And I said, brother, yes, I can. He said, where? And I went to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17, and I read that to him. And he's saying that, no, covet is not the same as lust. That's what he said. And then he started to explain all these things about, oh, you can have sex with somebody's wife, but not want their wife. Insinuating that Exodus 20 and 17 is only saying that you're taking somebody's wife to wife them and not just to lay with them. 
And that's not what the text is conveying, right? And that's what the discussion that we were having, that was a dichotomy and the juxtaposition in regards to our discussion. I don't care if he says words wrong. I say words wrong. We all say words wrong. And we clown each other for that, right? Because we want each other to be exact. Because when we're talking to people outside of our communities and we're trying to convey this information, we have to be on point and we have to be right and exact. So that was a light thing. You know, Jay clowns me all the time. He said, and again, I don't know how long you've been in here. He was clowning me in the chat, calling me, I don't believe in the Bible. He was saying all types of stuff in the chat, right? I don't take that seriously, sis. I make jokes about him too. This is what me and Jay do. We do this all the time. And it's mutual because we know there's, there's no uh, maliciousness behind it. We're just joking. That's why me and him can build for hours without the name calling, the, the cursing, all this other crazy stuff, right? And I said to him, hey, from what I'm seeing, the consensus in the chat is that there's Christians that are not agreeing with you, Jay. That's what I said. And he says, wait, let me see some Christians that's on the panel. Then he called you and you was in the middle of laughing from you and Halima going back and forth. And then that's when he asked you that, right? Obviously, he's he wants you to side with him and saying that covenant and lust are two different things. But I was saying that the same Greek word is being used there in the same sense. If you want to go and break down or parse out how the verb is inflected in both instances, we can do so and you will see the same thing. Same essence being conveyed. The only slight difference is that because the syntax is different, right? Because of what's being said, you'll see some slight nuances in the inflection. But if you look to see in what tense and what mood, et cetera, you'll understand that it's the same. And all I was simply doing for clarification so that people didn't have to take my word for it was I was going back to a source that people who are interested in the language can go back and look for themselves. It's not a biased source. So that way they can research what both of us are saying and not take our word for it. And I think that's the only way to do objective scholarship because I don't want nobody to believe anything that I'm saying and take my word for it. I could be lying. All right. right? You're right. So man, look, man, listen, so, listen, let me so, ask you a question. Guys, yes. Can I ask you a question? Okay. Sure. Can sure. a word be the same, right? Throughout the text, like the same exact Greek word or Hebrew word and still have a different meaning or different context. Right? Yes. And this is, this like, is, I so mean, this is, so this is what inflection is, right? If inflection will indicate that. For example, in Hebrew, you have different tenses. So you can have an aorist tense, which is a simple past action that occurred. You can have the past tense. You can have the present tense. You can have the future tense, right? It could be indicative. It can be active. It could be passive. So it's all in how the verb is inflected. Okay. What I'm encouraging people to do. So yes, you listen, know I'm listen. not talking. So, and, and that would determine. I'm not talking about that though. You see what I'm saying? Like I feel you. I love your passion for teaching, and I think you're an awesome teacher. But I, but just when you when you answer it like that, it switches the lane. But maybe I didn't articulate myself well because that's not what I'm talking about, brother. I know about different tense. I'm not talking about past tense versus future tense, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something as simple as the word for version, right, in the Septuagint, and that word version. We're talking about the virgin birth. The room is about the virgin birth, right? That that word for version, right, is the same word, right, <laughs> and several different places right but it can give a different kind of connotation and even if i or context shall i say but even if 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 i move from the word version and i go to um the scripture in james when it says the lust of the flesh right the lust of the eyes and the pride of life you know that scripture right would you not agree that the lust of the flesh is something different than the lust of the eyes Yes. Although it's the same word, is it is given a different. Um, we can say syntax if that's the better word for you. If you don't like context or or connotation, if I, if I'm misusing that word, if that word is not accurate, I'm okay with that. I can yield to that. But we know we're talking about two different things. It's not just the lust of the flesh is not the same lust of the eye, but it is the same inordinate desire. I get that. And that's why I said I can't agree with you. I just, I just really wish, like a lot of times, especially in, in um, when we compare the two texts, or when we like kind of mowing the lawn down on something real um, simple, 
it's like, man, we could have moved on to like a, a better topic or we could have shift gears, man. If, if, if people could just go ahead and agree and build the brother up, like Jay is not as knowledgeable as you. We already get that. We know that. And so it's like, if I ask um, Jody a question, right? If he, it, like a math question, generally speaking, like if we are like on air or on a podcast or something, if the person takes more than a certain amount of seconds to answer, you go ahead and you answer the question because you're, you're covering them. But I know we ain't in an atmosphere where you have to cover him because he is poking at you and challenging you. So I get that. And so he get what he get because he challenging you. Does that make any sense? But I did understand what Jay was saying. I don't necessarily feel like he was actually agreeing with you per se. Like, I don't think he knew that that was the same Greek word. At the same time, I do feel like because you are a teacher, because you do see things, like the higher we go, we see things from a different vantage point and we can see the holes in different stuff, right? And so I op that's an opportunity to bring somebody up. You know what I'm saying? Not expose them in their ignorance or whatever, and especially think that I'm going to come in and, and expose that in them. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to cover the brother in the sense of like, I'm, you know, let me, let me cover them. Let me, and, and the Israelites do it all the time. For, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if you consider yourself a Christian. I didn't think you consider yourself a Christian. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to do that for Jay either, but I can't do that. I can't just come in and be like, you know, just expose, like, like lead a brother hanging. It's like, no, bro, we understood what you were saying. You know what I'm saying? At the same time, this is this and that's that. You see what I'm saying? Both can be true, but we're talking about two different things. That's it. But y'all, y'all, we good for real, for real. Y'all know how we go. I ain't just sitting up here trying to bite nobody's head off. I was really enjoying the songs in the chat. Yeah. So next time, I'm gonna need you to cover me like you did, Jay, and not call I'm me any names. I'm and you apologize, to, but I just want to make I'm sure that's your decorum going Divine, forward. Because for you didn't say nothing about how he was trolling me in the chat <laughs> and how he was he was saying all the stuff you were saying when you came on the stage that I didn't believe in the Bible and all this other stuff you started saying but, about. But you know what? Right? And he called the people dumb. Wait, 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 wait. He called everybody dumb, including you. Right, and I had to check him on that and say, "Wait a second, don't call the audience dumb. They're not dumb, right?" And I had to correct him on it. You didn't come up here covering me and say, "Hey, you know what, Divine? Divine is right too, right?" It's just that, like Jody did. Jody came into our conversation and said, "Hey, brothers, I'm just trying to say I think y'all are missing each other with what you're saying." Um, he didn't take nobody's side. He was being objective, right? And he was trying to give some clarity to the audience and what the discrepancy was that me and Jay were having. Like he came in, in, in respectful, he came in love, and that's how you mediate. Not saying you don't, because I've seen you do that before, but like you said, this is after 12 o'clock. If this is how you get going for it, sis, when you come on stage, I'm just going to go to the audience. No, I love you, you don't got but to I don't want to go back and forth with you like this, sis, because I do love to. you. And and I, and I did not want to say anything out of character because I don't I don't like to argue with women. I think it's catty for men to do that. So you never heard me argue any sister down in any room that you ever heard me on. Never disrespected a sister. Never argue her down. Never threaten call out the name. I don't carry myself like that. Right. You're right. You don't carry yourself like that. But listen, I wasn't trying to argue with you though. I just wanted to finish my thought. That's it. You good? You so good? I know. You yeah. Know, yeah. And you did let me eventually, but you were like it seemed like as soon as I wasn't going in your direction. You were trying to kind of like control it a little more. And I get that. And that's fine. I just don't like to be controlled. But I will say this. You're right. I have not extended you a certain grace on this app. You know what I'm saying? And um, and, and I will be no, more you're mindful. Good. You're good, sis. No, you're good. No, no, I'm just confessing. Like, I'm being honest. Like, like I'm not thinking like um, shots fired at Divine. You know, I might shoot some, you know, I'm like in the chat, I'll shoot, shoot some shots at you too. Does that make any sense? But I, it's more of a, a testament to your prowess, to your 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 knowledge, to you know um, uh, the fact that you you are knowledgeable in the scriptures, right? You're knowledgeable with your sources. We know that. So I get a lot of shots because I'm just out front. So I just thought the shots kind of come with the territory a little bit. At the same time, you see what I'm saying? You're a person too. And you, you know what I'm saying? You being patient too, you know what I mean? And so you don't want your character disparaged. You don't, you didn't come for a certain kind of contention, right? But you do it, You, but you do your contention in a different way. And that's all I'm trying to let you understand. Like that, it's still, 
uh, contentious, but it's in a more graceful way. You do it in a more subtle way. At the same time, you know, it's still smoke in a certain, it's still smoke. So I just bring it in a different way, but it's not personal. And I'm sorry if it feels personal. And I don't ever want you to feel like you got to leave the stage or leave the room because she here and rah, rah, rah. You know what I'm saying? No, you, so now, you, now, now you're good, sis. It's because like I have. I will be more mindful. No, no, no. To give you a lot more grace. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and vice versa. Because I do come for your neck. I be coming for you. Yeah, like, and guess what? And I be covering you. you know? Like when you mention the words Jesus was saying on the cross in a Galilean dialect, who sent you the sources? Who jumped out there to defend you on that? I didn't have to I do don't, that. But I don't know if I, I agree or disagree sources, with you. Though. Did I use? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, when you was making that point, nobody wanted to hear what you were saying, and I came in and I defended your position because I spoke after you, and then I also say, sis, I hear what you're saying. Here's a source. I got, I, I got the uh, chat still. I mean, the messages, right? And you said, thank you, Divine. That's exactly what I was trying to convey. I appreciate that because. I wanted to cover you. I didn't. I didn't like how they was jumping on you and they was disagreeing, wanting to let you talk or anything like that. I stepped in and I assisted you, right? Because I care and I know that you mean well when it's not after midnight, right? Um, so with that being said, I'm just saying that um, even though we can disagree, that's fine, right? And me and Jay at that point we was not throwing personal shots or anything like that. I could see that was the the spirit was coming in, like going back and forth. But we were just actually trying to go in and. and he was trying to explain covet and lust. I was just saying in the Greek word, it's the same. You're saying, well, something can be, two things can be true at the same time. And then you gave the explanation of it, right? And I and I don't I, I don't agree. I agree as to that. So to close off, if it's okay with you, I wanted to read a commentary that goes into explanation of the text. Just so we can see when it comes to Matthew 5 and 28, what is the point of reference that when scholars look at that text, these are Bible-believing Trinitarian scholars for the record, just so you know. And I can give you the author's name, right? The author's name is Grant R. Osborne. You can look him up and see what his affirmations are, okay? He does not agree with my theological position at all. I'm simply just dealing with the language of the text, right? And that's, that, to me, is dominant if we're going to try and figure out why are we contending on this word for lust or covet, when it's the same word used in the same sense in both uh, the the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I was just going to show that what he's saying here, after an explanation of the text and going through the Greek, he says, Jewish writing also equated lust with adultery in the heart. And then he goes on to say, first in the 10th commandment against coveting your neighbor's wife. And he gives you the scriptures for that, Exodus 20 and 17 and Deuteronomy 5 and 21. And then in other teachings, such as Job 31 and 1, where Job says that I will make a covenant in my eyes so that I don't have to lust after a virgin, right? It has uh, Job chapter 31 and 9, Sirach 9 and 8. And then he goes into Greek text, which explains as well this particular word that's used here, right? And then he says, Jesus stresses the purpose in order, and that is to lust after her and that the sin occurs in the heart. In our day, this can occur any number of ways with one being more dangerous. And then he goes into other ways that we can desire a person's wife without realizing it. And they give an example of pornography, right? When people go to watch pornography, you don't know if that woman that you're lusting after trying to get off on is married or not. And, this, and people do that all the time. That's the danger in engaging in that if you don't know if that person is actually married or not. You're still doing it without physically committing the act. And this is what they're given the application for. And what they're showing here, and it goes into the footnote in verse 3, and it says the aorus tense to lust after the present tense to look places the looking in the foreground and the lusting in the background. Right? So imagine when you're reading the text in the original language, how the emphasis in the Greek, it places it on what we will call the word lust, right? That's that's the, the emphasis. However, it's actually getting giving you the look a little bit more in focal point than that. And the looking is what leads to the lust, right? And what happens with Jesus is that he's performing mitrash. He is expounding on the law, right? Things that give us some insight that may have been glanced over previously, He's not doing anything in contradiction to the law because then he would not be the perfect sacrifice. So he's doing everything in accordance to the law. But what happens is as a prophet, you're coming to people that the Mosai told the prophets who are deaf, dumb, and blind. 
and you're trying to explain something to these deaf, dumb, and blind people, and they're not even getting it. Even if you break it down and give them more understanding or maybe a different uh, outlook on it, they're still not going to receive it. But this is a testimony against them. So when judgment comes, they have no excuse that somebody did try to correct them and they did not receive that correction, right? And I think what Jesus was doing is acting in love because love covers a multitude of sins, right? And through his teaching, he was trying to give people an opportunity to repent. In Mark chapter 1, verses 15 to 16, the first thing he says with Mark being the uh, proposed first uh, synoptic gospel, he says, repent for the kingdom is at hand. That is Jesus' intent for teaching the people is for them to turn from their wicked ways and back to righteousness. And because the people insistently did not want to do that because they were stiff-necked and hard-headed, it cost them his life on their behalf. So I was just simply trying to explain to the brother when we went to Luke chapter 16 and 16, and maybe I, I could get your um, explanation on this before I bow out, right? And I stayed, I, I gave some grace. I stayed a little extra because you're my sister and you came into the dialogue that we welcomed you in on. And I just wanted to ask you to see your perspective. How do you interpret Luke 16 and 16? And after you share that with me, I'll give you my perspective and then I will leave. All okay. right. R quick clarifying question, though. If if a man was watching a porno and she's not married, would that still be lust and would it still be inordinate? Yes, it would. But it's not breaking what Jesus is saying, because you cannot commit adultery in your heart if somebody's not married. OK, so so it'd be inordinate in a different way. What way would it be inordinate? We said what way would it be well, inordinate? For you to desire what a woman. Would it be if it's not called if it's not called adultery, what would it be called? Because what it would lead to was consequences for laying with somebody who's a virgin, which is prohibited against Torah, unless you're married with them. Yeah, no, I'm talking or about something a pro like a, a porno. So she's not a virgin. She's she's getting ran through. So well, well, I, well, obviously, unless she's doing something else and she's not getting penetrated, but that's another conversation. We don't have to get explicit on here, right? Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> right, um, if a man is looking at that, what's going to what's going to happen is he's going to start desiring women in that fashion. He's going to objectify women in that way because he is watching an act that two adults consent and those are performing and he is not the party for it. Uh, voyeurism is prohibited in scripture. Right. And that is the act that he's performing. So so it wouldn't be adultery in in the in the event of watching it in and of itself is not a sinful act it's when he starts projecting that onto the other women is, is it, that what it you're leads saying? to those things like, so for example you brought up a scripture in john right that talked about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life isn't that what you brought up earlier i did gotcha so the lust of the eyes is what will be happening here and what does this give birth to sin the actual act, it starts in the heart and is performed with the body. So what happens is this brother will be breaking Torah where it says, do not make whores out of the daughters of Zion. It's not specific whether they're married or not. You can't just go around just to be sleeping with women just to sleep with women because you're turning them into whores. So that is reserved for their so husband. Sleeping with them with your eyes, like just, just raping them with your eyes. Is not a problem. Is <laughs> no that that definitely is a problem. I, I, I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. I said the okay, lust of the I'm, eyes. I'm missing it. I'm missing it. Yeah, you said the lust of the eye. You did say that. Okay, so yeah. it still seemed like it, it, the it's the like word adultery you, says means what? What does adultery mean? No, I get you. That is a mm -hmm. married woman. I I, I get that, that that teaching. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. As far as adultery. Um, I guess my question is like uh, in First Corinthians, I believe it's chapter six, it's chapter seven, when it says it's better to marry than to burn in your flesh. Correct. What is, what is that burning in your flesh? Like what what is okay. that connotation for that? I'm going to explain that to you, and then hopefully we can get back to the back to it, scene, which I just like, Okay, gotcha. When, when we hit, when we see, I'm gonna that, read it for that you. Lust, mm -hmm. That lust, that um, lust, you've already committed adultery with her. Yes, yeah, two different words there. So let me, so 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, I'm going to read it in English. It says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with the woman. Now, that act right there is not the same thing that Jesus is saying because it's a totally different word and it's used in a different context, right? 
because Jesus, he referred to the law as his preface before he went into him expounding. And he said, you have heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. So he gave a preface, right? A foundational premise before he launched into his ex exegesis, right? Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this is now concerning the matters about which you wrote. So we don't know everything that they wrote to him, but they wrote something. And he says, it is not, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now that word there is the same word that we get the word pornography from, the word porn from, right? Because if, if you are, if you are committing an act of sexual relation, you are selling off or surrendering your purity because you're doing something without any intention of marriage. This is what he's addressing here, right? Would you agree so far? Yes, I do agree. I'm in Strong's looking up this word now. Gotcha. So um, so the word here in, in, in the first verse, uh, it's using the word touch. You'll see like the King James to say touch, right? Or it'll be like, um, haptomai, right? It'll be like to know somebody carnally, right? Touching somebody in a way that impacts or modifies their behavior or something along those lines, right? And then he goes down further in here and he begins to define what that means in verse two. And he says, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, and that's the word that you get porneos from, right? That's, you're going to see that in, in the Greek. Each man, the owner of him, wife, let him have to each own a woman, her husband, right? So to avoid sexual immorality with the word porneas, and we get the word porn or pornography from each man have his wife and each woman have her husband. So that way you don't have to sit in front of a screen and watch something illicit. If you are feeling that way, then you should marry so you can perform the act legally, ethically, Gotcha. Morally, right? So, so to finish, and it says the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to the husband. So it's saying that if you do marry now, if you want to express that quote unquote lust, you can do so within the confines of marriage. And that is what is honorable. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 13, one marriage is honorable in all, right? The marriage bed is undefiled. Right. So this is what this occurrence is. So if I, if a brother was struggling with that, right, for whatever reason, is everybody struggles with things differently. Some people, they, they're all into it. But when they become a believer, it takes some time for you to graduate from it. Right. It's a process because they've been doing that probably longer than they've been saved. All right. So you have to give them scriptures like that to say, hey, if you're single and you're burning or if you're married and you're burning, there's something else deeply rooted that needs to be addressed. Right. And the scriptures gives us enough. Um, information in order how to counsel, begin to counsel. And you'll see it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that Paul begins to deal with these problems that's happening in the church of Corinth. Matter of fact, if you go to the previous chapter, right, he says, flee sexual immorality. And he talks about your body is not meant for sexual immorality. Your mind is part of your body. Your brain is a physical element. The mind is the abstract element. That's part of your body. That's part of what you own for yourself. Do you want to make that a temple for something other than Christ? So, so he goes into this counseling session when he's trying to get people who are in Corinth. And at Acro Corinth, there was a temple of Aphrodite. And then you had the temple prostitutes that were both male and female that were there. And this was in a rock's throw of the church or the congregation that Paul was calling out. So this, this, Sexual immorality, this pornea, this selling off of your purity. You'll see that also in the help studies. They'll kind of outline that. And the thiers will also outline that. Is you're giving something that should be reserved for something sacred to just a commoner. And that was a no-no. Because now your body cannot be the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're glorifying something else than with God. Because it says you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So that's how I address that. If we were dealing with pornography, now, if you want me to address it from the Tanakh's perspective, we also have a, something in the Tanakh that addresses that as well. It starts with covetousness. It starts with lusting in your heart without committing the physical act. If you see that you're lusting and you're doing something that is inordinate that should not be done because it can lead to illicit acts, you should refrain from it. 
should not do that. You should not turn the daughters of Zion into whores. Prostitution should not be named amongst Israel. Whoredom is not accepted. And again, it starts with the heart. Moses said in Deuteronomy 10, verse 16, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. It's all about the heart condition. Right? So that's how I would counsel somebody yeah. if this was an issue that was going outside of what Jesus is saying, committing adultery in your heart with the premise, foundational premise being Exodus chapter 20, right? In verse 17. But then he goes a little deeper and says, no, I say to you that if you even look upon a woman, you've already committed the same word adultery. He says you've already committed it. Now, it's one thing to covet, not to covet, don't lust after it. But Jesus is now saying, no, no, no. Not only do you not lust after it, if you do lust after it, you already committed the act. This is a little bit more nuanced and detail than we get from Exodus 20 and 17. Right. So, yeah. Divine, so the word woman there, we would assume that that's already a wife. Which word? There's no word for wife in the Greek. Well, what I'm saying is the context that dictates what the context uh, would dictate that that woman is married, though, because Mm -hmm. of the adultery. Is that what you So, Gunaika, yeah. So, Gunaika is the the Greek word for woman, and Andras is the Greek word for man. There's no word for wife or husband, but the context dictates how it should be translated. So, what verse are you talking about? No, just the same one. We talk about that adultery. And the reason why I thought it was a word Mm -hmm. for wife versus woman is because uh, in that Timothy, I, uh, I suffer not a woman to teach. Mm-hmm. That word woman there. Um, it's gunaikos, right? Right. And I just, mm-hmm. you know, connotation-wise, you know, um, it could be like how we know that this person right here is a wife, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it was talking about husbands in that, and it was talking about women having children. And so the context in that Timothy could be wife too. I'm not changing the conversation, but just just no, some guess. things that I'm thinking about when you're talking. Like I'm thinking about the I wasn't even though I, I'm glad you gave me that breakdown about pornography and I'm sure people in the room can use it. Um, I was thinking about I, I have heard the Israelites say that, you know, a man can't necessarily um fornicate or he can't um cheat or um you know, lusting after a woman is natural. Like I've heard these in these different rooms from Israelites, right? And so we we see lust as um, something inordinate. Not always, of course, you can have lust for your husband, you know, in the right way. But what I'm saying is like, um, if the woman is not married, then the lust is not inordinate is kind of the premises that I always hear. And I always thought that there's a sexual immorality or impurity of the heart, like how you were just talking. I totally agree with that, that sexually pure is more than just see no evil, hear no evil. Like if it's in your heart and if it's in your mind, you've already been tainted. But I've heard, you know, like I said, a different position where it's like, nah, I mean, it's fair game. We get the look, you know, she married, you know, we get the lust, you know, that kind of thing. So I was just trying to see if you were coming from that angle or, you know, or if you would justify that position because the way you broke it down is the way I've heard people attempt to break it down. They never broke it down that extensively, but that's kind of what they would say. You know, lust and covenants are the same. It ain't nothing against, you know, a lesson after a woman who's not married, you know, like how else is you going to get her kind of thing, you know, th- that kind of rhetoric. So that's where my mind was with it, my stream of consciousness. Um, to answer your question about Luke 16 and 16, um, I think I read it similar to what, like I got the point of what Jay was um, saying when he first brought that out. Like I said, I was loosely listening, but uh, 16 and 16, when it says, um, hold on, let me pull it up real quick. Um, Luke 16 and 16, until John, right here, let's go. So it says, until John the Baptist, now I'm not looking at the inner literature, you know, I didn't look at the Greek or anything, so. Um, just off the top of my head, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. So um, that until to me is that um, the law and the prophets were preached in a certain way. Right. And then when John came, the, the, the good news and or what we call the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. So we see a difference happening, a shift there to me. 
So the until in the sense is is pivoting and showing you that we're shifting. So that's the way I would see it. Um, I do believe that the Old Testament conceals it conceals the good news and is a way that is actually revealed in the New Testament and unpacked in a different way. So I do believe salvation is all through the scriptures. I do believe the good news is there as well. Um, but the good news of the kingdom of God and the gospel that Paul said he preached, that no man taught him, that uh, if there's another gospel, let him be accursed, um, that God had to reveal it to him. Um, that gospel, I believe that it was ushered in with John and proclaimed by Jesus. And that that kingdom, um, that particular kingdom, the kingdom of God that is within us has come, right? And then, you know, um, there'll be a new physical kingdom as well. So that's that's kind of my breakdown gotcha. on it. Off so the like what me, yes, yeah, so what me and me and Jay disagreed, he's saying when it says unto John, that means after John, the law stopped. The law was no longer in effect, right? And what I said was, that's not the case. What the text is conveying, if you read what's, there after the semicolon is that since then, since that time period, because John was already dead when Jesus was talking at this point, since then he says, the gospel of the kingdom was preached and that everybody presses to enter it. And then that's when I asked Jay, Jay, can we find the gospel being preached in the law? And after back and forth, he admitted, yes. Can we find the gospel being preached in all the writings after the law? And he went and he agreed. And I said, can we also see the gospel being preached by John the Baptist? And he, he said, yeah, we agree. And I said, that's what the text is simply saying, that since the law and the prophets until John, that the gospel of the kingdom has been preached and all men are forcing their way to enter into it. Because he's saying this in juxtaposition to what the Pharisees were saying about him. So he's indirectly talking to them. Right. So that's what I was trying to share with him. And that's what led us to getting into what we went into the law. He went into Matthew 5 and 28 and said, show me this in the Old Testament. And I showed it to him. And that's when we had that difference of opinion. Right. So that's all the reason why I asked you, because I want to see what your position is. It sounds a little bit more nuanced than what Jay said. Um, and it sounds like it's the middle ground between what me and him both said. But thank you for sharing your perspective. That's all. I, I'm glad you see that though, because I think a lot of times, like like uh, Jody said, we miss each other, and um, and I know that salvation didn't start in the New Testament. You see what I'm saying? Like people were saved, you know, and they were uh, the good. The Bible says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. So you know, we that's exactly what I, that's exactly what I brought up to Jay because I said, brother, do you agree with the Proto Evangelion, which is the first gospel, which we see in Genesis chapter three and verse fifteen? And I asked him, I said, is that the gospel? And he said, yeah. And then I said, when Jesus said that Abraham was happy to see his day and he did, is that a reference to the gospel? He said, yes. I said, when Paul says that in the seed of Abraham, that all nations will be blessed and not seed singular, but seed plural, is that referring to the gospel? He said, yes. And I was trying to walk him all throughout the Tanakh Hebrew Bible Old Testament, showing him how the gospel has always been preached since the law and the prophets and what john was simply doing was being the forerunner to its fulfillment which is jesus he pointed everything to a physical person right because that was his his successor and then after john left out the scene then jesus when he came on the scene john's disciples asked jesus are you the one that we're looking for and he said to them stay with me for a little bit see what i do and then you go back and tell John that everything that he said has been fulfilled in me. So even though John was preaching that when John was in prison, maybe he had some time to think about a host. Maybe he was overthinking. And he sent his disciples to go and speak to Jesus. And Jesus wanted to prove that he is a fulfillment of what John was saying. And that that's where it stopped. Because now, not only was the gospel preached unto John, but it was being fulfilled with Jesus. Right? So, so there's no other prophets after that. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter one says that in times past, he spoke to us by way of the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke to us according to his son. John will be included in those prophets. It stops after John. 
And then the fulfillment of what they all preached about is in Jesus. Most definitely. And so Jesus came to, you know, reveal it. Like if I had to give an analogy, it would be like, uh, you know, um, kinetic versus potential, you know, kinetic ver potential energy versus kinetic energy. You know, like Jesus came saying the kingdom of God is at hand. You know, was that John the Baptist? Jesus Jesus first words was repent. Yeah, first Mark chapter one that you're referring to, Mark chapter one. Yeah, it's similar to that, John the Baptist a little correct. bit. Correct. So correct. But. <laughs> I mean they didn't they didn't come saying nothing different. I mean you can't enter yeah. the kingdom unless you repent. I right. mean that's that's a constant motif you see even in the old testament. I'm right? about to say John's first word was repent. Jesus' first word on the scene was repent. Correct. So, that's right. So yeah. That so with that, words. yeah, with that, I'm gonna bow out because I have to. Really yeah, well, I do so too. I, I gotta get up early time. in the morning. I'm kind of mad at myself, but yeah. I appreciate you, Divine. You should see a shift in a way that I build with you in the future. I really, really want to feel like I repented, but you know, y'all just keep no, you good. Pray for me, man. I'm you, you, to you see, better. sis. You know, listen, listen, listen. General, you are no listen. Time. I've seen you over the past the year. Thing. Listen, I've seen you over the past year, so, and I've seen how you transition, right and. Again, everybody's a work in progress, even myself. Nobody's excused from that, right? And when we are in the wrong and we admit to it, people should extend grace to forgive because otherwise they don't have the fruit of the spirit, right? And it goes both ways. I may say something in the future that may tread upon you personally, right? Or may say that's offensive to you. Once you let me know of it, instead of me defending what I did, I'll admit, you know what? I'm wrong, right? I apologize, right? I, I need to work on my patience more. I need to work on my long suffering more because this is the only way that if somebody was to look at this, who's an atheist would know if we're really called by Yah or not is the love that we demonstrate towards each other. Right. And first Corinthians 13 explains how that love should look. So if they was to pick up the Bible and that was the only chapter they know, they would have to come in a conversation like this and say, are these really believers? Like, damn, I'm reading what's here in first Corinthians 13. Like, and, and we see this Christine in all types of rooms we're in all types of bantering and disrespect and all types of stuff. So it's very difficult when people see this, that we try to talk to unbelievers and they can say, well, I just saw you in the other room cursing somebody out. You a Christian? So it's all in the fruits. This is why, this is why uh, uh, John says that make fruits meet for repentance. If we say we repent and I'm sorry, but there's no fruit that comes after that, then we wasted our time. And if I ever offended you in the past, and I'm going to say this on the record, right? I apologize because I may have done it and I don't know about it, right? So if I have, I'm asking you to forgive me in advance. And so we can leave this as water on the bridge because one thing about love is that after you repent and after you admit and you're forgiven, this shouldn't come up again. Because if you hold it against somebody, then you wasn't doing it for the sincere purpose of love. You was doing it for the same purpose because you wanted to be right for righteousness sake. And, and that is how we demonstrate who we are, our identity. If we're going to say we're in Christ, that's how believers turn from their wicked ways when they see us being the shining example. So I appreciate your decorum afterwards. And you can see, we, this is how we usually build. Like we're cool, we lay back, right? There's no strife or anything like that. And again, there's other factors that can perpetuate, you know, the energy to rise. But at the end of the day, as long as we do this, Christina, after we're done, and we can leave people on a positive note that, yes, I see they had a disagreement, but right now, look at them. They didn't leave or let the sun go down on their wrath. This is scripture actualized. This is what I'm witnessing. So these people have been regenerated. They have been, Romans 12 and 1, they have been transformed. And this is the only way we demonstrate it. And I'm just a servant. It doesn't matter how much I know. It's only as good as who I share it with and who I bring on the same level as me. And that's why I was in here initially sharing what I was sharing and giving sources so there's no ambush scholarship and people can follow what I'm saying, right? I, I, I don't like having a conversation if the person I'm talking to doesn't have everything that I have. So I try to share it with them based on the context of the conversation, right? Yes, I don't sir. like the I got you. I don't like the surprise because that's not genuine. That's not sincere. Like the person is not trying to edify and love if they do that. So that's why even though people say, oh, not, I ain't going to say everybody, but some people say, oh, using this source, that source, but at least I'm sharing it. I could be like these pseudo people in here and just say something random and have you believe what I'm saying. But that's not, that's not genuine. God does not work like that. He works in transparency. 
So we have to be able to demonstrate for people, not only in how we convey it, but also our hand. We have to open up our hands so they can see that we're not hiding a stone. And what happens with a lot of people, sometimes they keep their hands closed because they're hiding a stone. They're just waiting for an opportunity to throw at you. But love shows open hands. It's always giving. It's always trusting. Despite what somebody else does, we are responsible for how we respond and how we act. And that's all I want to say. So most much definitely. love to you, sis. Yep, most love to you, quick, sis. Quick and if you question. Anything, let me I know, know. you sure. need a quick question. Are you a virgin birth or no? You say, is that my position? Yeah, just what's your position? No, that's not my position. What I admitted in this room was that the Greek text confirms or affirms a virgin birth. Okay. So I don't disagree okay. with that. But my position is not predicated on the Greek text because there are textual variants that more align with the pedigree that I follow than what your Orthodox Christian would. And that's my position. So, on that. so you just confused. that's another conversation. Okay. That's another I, no, conversation. No, I'm not, you don't got to unpack okay. it. I just wanted to see. But just generally speaking, you said you feel like the Greek text. I just want to see if I can repeat it back. Does confirm a virgin birth, but your position, far as the pedigree, you would probably go with him being the son of Joseph. If that's what yeah, you're based on the OSS manuscript. What's the OSS? The old Syriac Sinaiticus. Oh, okay. You got to back chat that or something. But thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I shared that. I shared that earlier so that everybody can go take a look at it. I'll definitely send it to you. And I just feel that it's more consistent with the narrative. And again, that's just my personal perspective. But I'm not going to mutilate what the Greek says to fit my my position. I'm just going to show you why I I hold my position based on textual evidence that does exist and that does support it. It may be being a minority, and I'll admit that it is the minority, right? But it is historical based on the sects that did subscribe to it. And we see some of those sects in their earliest forms in Acts chapter 21 with James.